We've all heard the saying, you can't judge a book by its cover. Take this blonde, middle-aged, well-educated woman. She looks like any other soccer mom. I hate your f***ing gut so bad I can't even stand you. Well, not so much. Yes, it's difficult to ever really know someone completely. Do you ever feel like you wasted your life? I've seen some pretty ugly things, but this is just horrific. This is something out of a movie. And you just wait, it's coming so weak hard. This is Deadly Wise. July 10th, 2003, Clovis, California, a picture-perfect slice of suburbia. Nestled between Central California's richest farmland and the spectacular Sierra Nevada mountains. It's the kind of place where old friends like to get together for lunch, like Bob and Mary Solis were planning to do with their friend Tim Schuster. But Tim was late, very late. Bob and Mary were getting worried. It was so out of character for Tim. He was really on the spot, punctual. My God, he drove me nuts as being as punctual as he was. Tim wasn't answering his phone either. And after talking to friends, they learned Tim hadn't shown up for an important meeting that morning. Now, Tim doesn't blow off appointments. So I called up Vic Uribe and I said, you need to go over the house. Vic Uribe was Tim Schuster's best friend. Tim didn't answer the front door. Vic let himself in, but there was no sign of Tim. I was feeling just scared, scared that something drastic could happen to him. Not knowing is probably the worst thing. Then something caught Vic's eye. In the sink, there were unwashed dishes from dinner the night before. Tim Schuster was a neat freak. Tim, you here? I started going from room to room. And when I got to Tim's bedroom, I looked on the dresser, and I found his cell phone, his wallet, his watch. I was pretty shook up because I, I couldn't find, I didn't know where he was at. The reason Tim's friends were worried was that Tim had been going through a rough patch lately, a really rough patch. He'd just been laid off from his job in the cardiology department at the local hospital. Downsizing, they told him. The meeting he'd missed that morning, it was about his severance package. And Tim's personal life, well, that was going even worse. Tim had been married for 20 years, and now he and his wife Larissa were divorcing. It was such a tragedy. They had been so happy once upon a time. Tim and Larissa were both from Missouri, America's heartland. They met in college where Tim was working on a nursing degree and Larissa was a graduate student in biochemistry. They say that opposites attract and right away Tim and Larissa seemed to fit together like two perfect puzzle pieces. She was a go-getter, bubbly and ambitious. He was shy, sensitive and loyal. In 1982, Tim and Larissa married and started a family right away. In 1989, Larissa got a great job offer at an agricultural lab in California, and the young family moved west. Once they settled in, Tim got a job too, but it was Larissa's career that really took off when she opened her own lab in Clovis. Larissa spent day and night at the lab to turn her business into a multi-million dollar success story. She was a very hard worker. She knew what she was doing. She, she knew the business, and she was a real great person to work for. All right, ladies, well, thank you. I'm going to hang out for a bit and uh, get some more things done. Tim, on the other hand, was a homebody, happy to play a support role working as a middle manager and being Mr. Mom to their two kids. Tim loved his family, loved Larissa, just a very, very wonderful individual, and no one had a bad word to say about Tim. Except apparently for his darling wife. After two decades of wedded bliss, 
Let's just say the honeymoon was over. This is Marisa. Call me at the house, ass. It was the oldest story in the book, fairy tale on the outside, nightmare on the inside. He was a little bewildered that she could turn this way after they had been together for a considerable amount of time. It became obvious to him more and more she had completely changed in her view of Tim as being a man. She just began to literally abuse him. What the hell, Tim? I told you I have my house keys. Why do you lock the door? And really, what, what started it or what made her that way is kind of a mystery. What have you been doing all day? What is this? Tim wanted to maintain the, the family focus, so he allowed her to do things that he didn't necessarily like. Do you ever feel like you wasted your life? And, and the more he allowed that to happen, the more vicious she became. I hate your fucking gut so bad I can't even you. I hope you burn in hell. Ah, uh, no one really knows what goes on inside a marriage, but this one clearly wasn't going well. They stopped sleeping in the same bed together. They argued about the children. And then it got to a point where Larissa just demanded that he leave. Get out of this house. Mild-mannered Tim hated confrontation, so he waited until Larissa was away on a long business trip, and then he moved out. He took a few things. And when she came back, she basically went ballistic because what she felt was hers was gone. She made some vicious, terrible phone calls. Now, if four stainless steel mixing bowls got that kind of reaction, just imagine how angry Larissa was when divorce lawyers got involved to divvy up the marital assets. The Schusters had a 3,500-square-foot home in Clovis's best neighborhood. There was a huge retirement fund, a fun money savings account with over $120,000 in it, and then there was Larissa's true love, the chemical lab, worth well over a million dollars. By California law, it was all community property, and that was not sitting well with hard-working, self-made Larissa. Larissa was very upset that Tim was in a position to get money from the business that she felt was hers and that he had no right to. The custody battle was just as nasty. She wanted to keep the kids, and she felt that she was the perfect mother, and Tim should be punished for this divorce. And it was happening right when Tim got laid off. So on July 10th, 2003, all this was going through Vic's head as he walked through Tim's empty home. And by the look of things, it appeared something was very wrong. Vic called the police. The next morning, Friday, July 11th, 2003, Officer John Willow went to Tim's house. I started announcing. I said, Tim, it's the Clovis Police Department. Are you home? Tim, Clovis Police Department, can you hear me? Tim, are you OK? No answer, no Tim, no sign of foul play. Everything in its place, as if Tim had simply walked away from his life. Except for one thing. There was a briefcase open by the front door, and next to it, an empty gun holster. And then I could see that the cushion on the chair was actually propped up a little bit. So as I bent down and looked just a little bit, I could see the butt end of a handgun underneath the cushion. Within hours, the Clovis Police Department had a search warrant, and Tim's disappearance was officially a missing person's case. For some reason, he brought this gun with him to the front door. Was there a threat? Was he concerned about something? Was there something that frightened him? And inside the open briefcase, there was a tape recorder. We pulled it out and listened to it. I will tell you one thing, if that ever happens again, you're dead. 
Tim had secretly been taping Larissa's venomous phone messages for months. Our initial reaction was, wow, this is who we're going to need to be talking to a little bit later. And she's not a very nice person. And they would later learn that that was the understatement of the century. This is going to come back to haunt you. And you just wait. It's coming so hard. Mild-mannered Tim Schuster was missing for two days. Detectives in Clovis, California, were at his home trying to find out what happened to him. Next to the front door was a briefcase with a tape recorder inside. On it, some messages from his estranged wife, Larissa, brought new meaning to the expression, irreconcilable differences. Now you see why she was the former love of his life. But back to the story. So police, hoping to find something that could lead them to Tim, checked his landline's caller ID. I saw that the last incoming call had been shortly after 2 o'clock in the morning on Wednesday night. Now, Wednesday was the day that Tim was last seen. A phone trace was ordered, and wouldn't you know it, the call was from Larissa. Detectives invited her in for a little chat. What I know is, you know, Tim and I are going through divorce, and it's just been stretched out for a long time, and we've had a difficult time communicating verbally, so we don't, we don't do that. Larissa, right off the bat, goes into a long narrative about their relationship. He's a very passive-aggressive person, and passive-aggressive people have a hard time accepting Anything that they do wrong, they blame, usually blame someone else. When we're interviewing somebody that's potentially not telling us the whole truth, they won't wait for questions and answers. They'll instead immediately throw out what they want you to hear. And Larissa wanted them to hear that she was a good Christian. We went to Hope Lutheran for several years. For 15, we lived out here 15 years. And um, I sang in the choir and how difficult it was to raise children these days. What she do? Go pierce her belly buttons, get tattoos everywhere. And was it her fault that Tim couldn't carry his weight in the marriage? I'm not embarrassed about talking about this. I hope it doesn't embarrass anybody yet, but for the last 10 years, there's been no sex in our marriage. He became, kind of, I would say, impotent. Gosh, I forgot where I was going with this. Detectives listened to Larissa's rambling stories for over an hour. Then it appeared that even Larissa seemed to realize that she just might be sounding a little crazy. She had a story for that, too. I, I've been on some Vicodin for the last few days, and I kind of dry mouth now and kind of stutter. I feel kind of, anyway, so. Um... Larissa just went on and on about everything and nothing at all. But look what happened when detectives asked her something really important. What is your gut feeling on where he's at right now? Is he alive? Is he dead? What's your gut feeling? I, I don't know. I don't know. OK. Suddenly, chatty Larissa wasn't so chatty anymore. Do you know of anybody that would want harm to come to him? Specifically, like the name of somebody? You know, while Larissa was stammering for answers, detectives noticed something. On the outside of one of her legs, she had three little half-moon scabs. And I've seen this before, working domestic violence cases, where someone had grabbed her leg forcibly and cut into her leg with their fingernails. And these appeared to be only a day or two old. So I had emailed him this week. A gardening accident, Larissa said. You see, everything could be explained until detectives asked her why her number was on Tim's caller ID the night he disappeared. No phone calls or anything from him or anything in that time frame? No unusual activity? Or was there? Not that I recall. Um, she said she had fallen asleep while watching a movie. I remember waking up on the couch and I had my cell phone and it looked like I might have hit a number or something. 
There it was, the old, I butt dialed my almost ex-husband in my sleep at 2 a.m. excuse. You're telling me that you rolled over and possibly accidentally telephoned him in the middle of the night on the night that he disappeared. Now, the story that Larissa told me about making that phone call to Tim at 2 o'clock in the morning accidentally just didn't make any sense. She said that she had his number on speed dial, and that was possible, but I wanted to investigate to go ahead and confirm that story. Is your cell phone here? Do you have your cell phone? No, I don't. I don't have it here. Where is your cell phone here? I have it at home. At home? Things weren't adding up. I, you know, excuse me one second. I'm so glad I apologize. And Detective Webert had a hunch. He left the room and checked the parking lot. It was getting late, and there were only a few cars. Larissa's Lexus stood out. I looked through the window, and I was able to see that there was a cell phone on the center console of the vehicle. I took out my cell phone and called Larissa's number, which was the same number that I had gotten from Tim's caller ID. And sure enough, the phone inside the car began ringing. So either she had completely forgotten that she'd left her cell phone in the car, or she was lying. You see where this is going. I let Larissa know, hey, good news. You thought you'd left your phone at home, but it's actually outside in your car. And can we get it so we can take a look? Let's go get that out of the way. Larissa didn't appear to be very happy about going to get her cell phone. And when it came time to show detectives the numbers on her speed dial. Eight is Tammy B. Nine is Dave Johnson. Tim's number was nowhere to be found. So the butt dialing story she had told detectives couldn't be true. It looked like Larissa must have figured out that things weren't working in her favor. Because the minute detectives left the room, she got busy. We were watching her on the camera inside the interview room, and she was manipulating her phone. And it was my belief that she was trying to program Tim's number into her cell phone speed dial. Uh, but, but it came up Tyler, and I went to check it, and I'm, and then I hit the menu or something like that, and I think I just deleted it. What this interview said to me was that no matter what's happened to Tim, Larissa in some way is involved in this disappearance. Larissa, let me ask you this. Are you the type of person that could have anything to do with him missing? No, not at all. No, I don't, I couldn't do, I can't. But acting nervous and lying about a phone call isn't enough to hold somebody in jail. Without a body, the Clovis PD didn't even know if there was a crime at all. They had no choice but to let Larissa go. By Saturday, July 12th, Tim had been missing for three days. Larissa hadn't given detectives a lot to go on, so they reached out to friends and acquaintances. But there was no one who knew more intimate details of Larissa's life than who else? Her manicurist. And unlike a licensed therapist, she didn't have to worry about patient confidentiality. So she had no problem telling police about a strange afternoon in the nail salon. The ladies were all bantering about their ex-husbands and how life would be easier if they just weren't here. And at one point, Larissa looked at, at Terry and said, I wish Tim were dead. She said, she looked at Larissa and said, oh, quit joking around like that. And Larissa said, no, I'm serious, and you know I have the means to take care of that. And then she reminded her about the burglary. Ah, yes, the burglary. In 2002, a year before Tim's disappearance, and not long after he moved out, his brand new home was broken into. The thieves were pretty discriminating. They left the big TV and the computer, and some cash that was lying around. Instead, what they were really after were a few wicker baskets, a book of recipes, and mixing bowls. That's right, four mixing bowls. And you know what, those mixing bowls are mine, so I, I expect to find all four of those returned. Tim didn't know for a fact that Larissa was behind that. There was no evidence to go ahead and tie her to it, but it was one of those things that based on the items that were taken, yeah, she was behind it. The word among Tim's friends was Larissa had paid somebody to help her steal back her stuff, and it looked like that somebody was a 21-year-old named James Fagone. James was an employee of Larissa Schuster's at her biotech company. 
he would do anything for her. I think he looked up to her as being smart and intelligent and a good business manager, and their relationship became very strong. So strong, in fact, that James started helping Larissa out at home. He did some housework for her. He babysat, he house sat, he took care of the dogs when she was out of town. And maybe he was also a mixing bowl burglar. Oh, and here's another important tidbit detectives came up with in Larissa's phone records. At 1.30 a.m., just a half hour before she butt-dialed Tim, it looked like she was butt-dialing, guess who, James Fagone. It was time for police to get better acquainted with Larissa's boy Friday. You spell your last name F-A-G-O-N-E? Is that correct? And James is your real first name? Yes. Larissa's errand boy looked pretty harmless, but even little boys can have deadly secrets. Monday, July 14th, 2003, Clovis, California. After 20 years, Tim and Larissa Schuster were getting divorced, and it wasn't an amicable ending. You're such a wimp. You have no spine. Have a great day, you son of a They were fighting over custody of their kids and all their marital assets. Then Tim mysteriously disappeared. Police brought Larissa in to ask her some questions. She rambled on and on. You know, there's times when I just wanted to punch him, you know? But I physically, I, I physically, I couldn't, I mean, he's a bigger man than me. I mean, I, I, I couldn't, I, he'd probably take me down in a minute. All the while making sure detectives knew there was no love lost between the once happy couple. He would come up to me and you know, do things like that to me. And Clearly, there were issues. So how could Larissa possibly know why Tim up and vanished? But police weren't buying the innocent act. So they brought in Larissa's right-hand man to clear things up. Enter James Fagone. Rumor had it the lab assistant slash nanny slash dog walker slash errand boy had added another hyphen to his long list of skills. Burglar and police wanted to ask him about it. Let's go back about a year ago. Did she encourage you to go to a place where he lived at the time to get some stuff? Um, no, She mentioned that he had been robbed. In the interview, Fagone was vague and confused. A while ago, I think she was asking me if I been by his house. I was like, no. Are you the kind of person where she would have paid to go over and help with that? Um, I don't think so. And if he didn't know, then who did? Detectives decided to play hardball. So you never, never, I never drove that over there or anything. So there would be no reason for your fingerprints like to be in the southern house. Oh, no. It looked like the pressure was getting to James, so police left him alone with his thoughts. And what did James do the minute they were out of the room? That's right, he played a game on his phone for 20 minutes. Perhaps the little game helped jog James' memory. Because when detectives came back in the room, James started spilling the beans. So this is your opportunity. Yeah, I, I went over there. And he didn't go alone. He told police that Larissa was with him. How did you guys get into the house? Went in through the garage. And I smashed the, the door with the screwdriver. There you go. Okay, that's what I'm talking about, the truth. It comes out easy. <laughs> you didn't have to think about it. Yeah. The truth started to flow so easily that James wanted to write about it. Soon there was a two-page statement admitting he'd helped Larissa burglarize Tim's home in exchange for a few pieces of Tim's electronics. What this told us is, is that James is willing to do things which are probably illegal to help Larissa out. And if she's willing to confide in him to that degree, then maybe she's willing to give him some information about where Tim is and maybe why he's disappeared. So we pushed on that point. But James Fagone wouldn't budge. He denied knowing anything about Tim's disappearance. Police decided to let him go. Detectives were no closer to finding Tim, 
but they had a gut feeling something bad had happened to him. The problem was we didn't have a body. We didn't know where a crime scene was. But five days after Tim up and vanished, one of Larissa's employees walked into the police department and gave detectives the break they desperately needed. She said she knew about Tim's disappearance and she wanted police to know that she had an unusual encounter with Larissa over the weekend. Larissa asked me if I knew anybody that had a truck with a lift gate so she could move a rototiller. She didn't. So Larissa asked Leslie to rent a truck for her in Leslie's name. Then Larissa took the truck. But she must have had a lot of trouble with the rototiller because she kept the truck out for hours. When Larissa finally brought it back, Leslie checked the mileage on the rental paperwork and noticed Larissa had only driven the truck 17 miles. Larissa lived 20 miles from the lab. And I had even questioned Larissa. I said, is that all the mileage that you put on? And she's, oh, it's not that far. Something in my gut tells me that this is not right. And there was something else. When Leslie came into work the next day, one of her co-workers mentioned that it looked like someone had been in the back room at the lab over the weekend. Things had been moved around, and a big blue barrel they kept back there was missing. That was the turning point for me. All the dots started connecting at that point. Leslie laid out everything that happened over the weekend for detectives, including Larissa's cryptic parting words when she dropped off the truck. Larissa said, don't say anything about the storage unit. Yes, there was a storage unit. Leslie told detectives Larissa had rented it a year earlier to hide some things she didn't feel Tim was entitled to in the divorce. And just like the rental truck, Larissa had gotten Leslie to rent the storage unit in her name. Before Leslie even left the station, detectives had a couple of patrol officers swing by the storage facility to see if anyone working there had any info about Larissa, a rental truck, or a blue barrel. No one did, but officers found something else. I received a phone call from one of them that was on scene. I distinctly remember him telling me that I needed to get out to the storage unit because there was a horrific smell coming from the area where her storage unit was. With Larissa being a chemist, we didn't know what could be in there. When the door rolled up, the smell was so intense Police needed the same kind of breathing gear that hazmat investigators use to get close. I looked inside, and I saw Christmas decorations and just some knickknacks. And a few wicker baskets that looked a lot like the ones reportedly stolen from Tim's house. But that's not what really caught Detective Cook's attention. Behind the Christmas decorations and underneath the wicker baskets, there was a piece of cardboard wrapped around a large object. As detectives moved toward it, they realized it was the source of the hideous stench. And when they removed the cardboard, they found a large blue barrel, and no one could believe what was inside. Monday afternoon, July 14, 2003, police who were looking for missing Tim Schuster were at his wife Larissa's super secret storage unit. Inside, they found old Christmas decorations, wicker baskets, and an overpowering, burn your eyebrows off, you might just pass out stink that forced police to don hazmat masks. And by the smell of things, it was all coming from a blue barrel. The barrel was just about full of some sort of thick liquid, and there was just body parts. I could recognize a leg bone and parts of a leg. Now it was clear what caused the terrible smell. It was human flesh dissolving in hydrochloric acid. That was probably one of the most disgusting things that I have ever seen in my 20 plus years in law enforcement. 
There was so much damage from the amount of acid that was in there, it was very difficult to tell anything other than, we knew we had found a body inside of a barrel, and now we had to make sure that it was Tim. They took the barrel from Larissa's storage unit back to the lab. It would take a DNA test to positively identify the melted remains. And where was Larissa while all this was happening? She was in sunny Florida, beginning a much needed vacation. Detectives worked quickly on getting an arrest warrant and extradition order. In the meantime, they brought in Larissa's go-to guy, James Fagone, to see what he knew about Larissa's storage unit and the body in the barrel. And this time, James was far more open with police. So you talked with her about killing Tim? Um, she had said that she wanted to. And what did she say? Well, just that, you know, she was she just sick and tired of it. And, and I knew she would try and pull me in on it, but... And she did. Yeah, she did. But what did she say? She she did pull you in, James. We know that. And that's why, that's why you're here, and that's why we're talking, OK? And that's when 21-year-old James Fagone cracked like a fragile porcelain doll. He told detectives the whole story of the night Tim disappeared. You guys go over there. And you go to the front door? Yeah. Front door. And what happens at the front door? I heard some talking. I kind of stepped aside to where I could be seen. James said he could hear her say, I'm at the front door. I need your help. Tim brought his gun to the door just to make sure Larissa wasn't setting him up. When he saw Larissa standing outside alone looking distraught, he believed she needed his help. That's when Tim tucked the gun in the seat cushion. Then he opened the door. James lunged from the shadows at that point and tackled Tim. James was smaller than Tim, but he had two things on his side, the element of surprise and a stun gun that Larissa had asked him to buy for the occasion. You know what part of his body had impacted him on it? Just all over. I was just trying to, whatever. How did he react to that? He was just like, but, uh, you know, uh, I figured that's what was going to happen. Did he say anything? He was just like, hey, hey, uh, what the hell is going on? There was a struggle. Tim reached out and clawed Larissa's leg. She used chloroform to subdue him and put him into a deep sleep. Larissa and James drove him back to Larissa's house. Once inside her garage, Larissa and James transferred Tim from the truck to the large, empty blue barrel. When you guys were putting him in the barrel, when you guys were putting Tim in the barrel, what was he doing when that was going on? Well, he was real like that, and I, I heard some noise like breathing, but... Did he ever say anything? No. Did he ever moan? Sounded kind of like that. And there it was, the horrible truth. Tim was still alive when they put him in the barrel. But this kidnapping was going to end in murder. Larissa dragged out a case of hydrochloric acid bottles she was hiding in her garage and started pouring them. One by one into the barrel. So that means that while he's in the barrel and she's pouring the acid on him, he's either dying as a result of aspiration of the acid fumes or from the actual immersion in the acid. You can't fathom somebody actually dying like that. It just seems like it's like it would be so painful and so horrible. In fact, the fumes were so caustic, they made even seasoned chemist Larissa woozy. After just three bottles, she had to stop pouring the acid and get the lid back on quick. Larissa and James then dragged the barrel to the garden shed and called it a night. Remember Larissa's interview with the police the day after her husband was reported missing? What, what is your gut feeling 
on where he's at right now. Is he alive? Is he dead? What's your gut feeling? I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. And the whole time she was talking to police, her missing husband was not missing at all. When she was finished, it was as if it was any other day. She went back home and hopped into the hot tub where James was waiting for her. How do you go about your life knowing that there's a dead guy in a barrel in your side yard? Exactly what Larissa must have been thinking while she was sipping Chardonnay and warming her feet in the jacuzzi. She looked at James and said, I can't keep him here. You need to help me move him. So just a few hours after she'd been questioned by police, Got it? in the wee hours of Saturday morning, Larissa and James dragged the barrel with Tim inside out of the shed and brought it over to her lab. When they got to the lab, Larissa opened the barrel. Three gallons of acid hadn't done the job. To get rid of Tim completely, she needed to add more. After topping off the barrel, I was like, you know, get out of here. And she's like, yeah, you know, I, I've got it from here. You know, you know, just go home and shut up and you'll be OK. But Larissa realized everything wasn't OK. After adding the additional acid, the barrel began to smell. And it was probably going to get worse before it got better. It couldn't stay at the lab. But the logical chemist Larissa was always thinking. That's when she talked to Leslie about helping her get a rental truck. Uh, you want to take her? Now that police knew exactly what happened, it was time to bring Larissa Schuster in for the cold-hearted and brutal murder of her husband, Tim. But bringing her down wasn't going to be easy. Forty-three-year-old Larissa Schuster got off a plane in St. Louis, Missouri, expecting to see her mom and dad waiting at the gate. Instead, she was greeted by two police detectives who had a surprise for her. Handcuffs and a one-way ticket back to California. She didn't protest. She didn't say, what in the heck is going on here? Why are you arresting me? Because she knew why she was being arrested. And also interesting to me is that she didn't say at any point, what happened? How did he die? Larissa went right to jail and stayed there while prosecutors built their case against her and her accomplice, James Fagone. James went to trial first. His defense? Big, bad, acid-pouring, barrel-toting Larissa Schuster forced him to do her dirty work. And he was afraid to say no, after all. If Larissa was the kind of woman who'd go ballistic over mixing bowls, imagine what she'd do if James squealed. The jury didn't buy it. At some point, a normal human being would say, that's it, I'm calling the cops, you can't do this. James just went along, went along, went along, went along, and then just got deeper and deeper into it. And there's just no excuse for that. James Fagone was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Not good news for Larissa Schuster. If James was going away forever, Larissa knew she was in for the fight of her life. So when her trial finally started in 2007, she was ready for battle. Do you solemnly state that the testimony you may give in the matter now pending before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you out? I do. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, no lightning bolt from above, so Larissa was off to a good start. Step one, build sympathy with the jury. How long have you been in custody? About four years and four months, shy a few days. And you're still in custody? Yes, I am. That's why you're wearing jail issues and tennis shoes. And the nice bracelet that I have on too. Humor. It was unbelievable. She was joking from the stand while on trial for murder. Let me ask you a very direct question. Did you kill your husband? No, I did not kill my husband. Now watch this. Eye contact with the jury. 
classic. This is Exhibit 346. Larissa's defense was simple. She had nothing to do with Tim's murder. She was completely innocent. Instead, she pointed the finger at her right-hand man. It was all James Fagoni that, that he had heard her say how Tim was abusing her and stealing from her, and that James decided that he would take care of the problem for her. And according to Larissa, he was maybe just a little in awe of her brilliant career as a chemist and infatuated by her charming personality. Larissa's defense was James showed up at her front door with Tim's body and said, look what I did for you, like a cat who had brought a sparrow that it had killed and dropped it on the front porch for, for its owner. It was an interesting defense, considering they could cast doubt on Larissa's role in Tim's murder, and James legally couldn't be called to testify because he'd already been tried and convicted. So then the case became a very, very circumstantial case, which meant every single detail became very important. Larissa was grilled on the stand for five days straight. Yes, I do. But she never lost her cool. In fact, she coasted through the questioning like she was reading from a script, starting with why she lied about the 2 a.m. phone call. I got scared that they might think that my phone call had, might have had something to do with Tim's disappearance at that time. For five days, the evidence mounted against her, the barrel, the acid, the storage unit, the rental truck, the phone messages. Call me at the house, The lying, the hatred. It just been a matter of hours since you learned that your husband was killed and his body was in the shed right next to your own house, right? Yes, that's true. It should have been a slam dunk case, but Larissa's performance was truly Oscar worthy. And it looked like it convinced the jury. It was a little nerve-wracking because the jury was out, like, I believe, five or six days. When the jury came back, Larissa gave her attorney a quick hug. Then the foreman read the verdict. We, the jury in above entitled action, find the defendant, Larissa Schuster, guilty of violation of Section 187 of the Penal Code, first-degree murder of Timothy Schuster. The fact that this woman could exist in society and yet be such a chameleon and be so evil inside and not have it be apparent. It's the next door neighbor. And yet that next door neighbor was vicious. And that's, that's a frightening thought. As vicious as the crime was, the jury surprisingly recommended Larissa's life be spared. Perhaps it was out of compassion, just not for Larissa. The reason Larissa never got the death penalty is because Satan wasn't ready for her in hell. He wasn't even ready to come up against somebody so evil. Ah, oh, wedding vows. We all know the words. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. Most of us say them with the best intentions, but for some people, the only way to keep those vows is to hurry along the last one till death do us part. Something stinks about this, Gary. Sometimes the fairer sex, the one you'd least expect, is the one capable of unspeakable acts. This wasn't a bar fight. Oh, this wasn't road rage. We have a subject that has a gunshot wound. This was a cold and calculated murder. From former beauty queens to all-American cheerleaders. I've never shot a gun in my life. Deadly wives come in all shapes, sizes, and endless varieties of crazy. They're leaving. They're leaving. In the 30 years I've been a DA, I've prosecuted a lot of really nasty people. I've never dealt with a woman as evil and selfish as this particular woman is. This is Deadly Wives. Something ain't right here, man. I'm telling you. Welcome to West Goshen, Pennsylvania, a suburb of Philadelphia that's made the list of top 10 best towns in America. It's the kind of place where kids grow up and stay to raise their own families. 
So June 20th, 2010 was a big day. It was Father's Day. Kevin Mengel Sr. and his son Kevin Jr. had recently healed their rocky relationship and the whole family was gathering for a special celebration. Kevin and I had not spent a Father's Day together in seven years. And uh, we were very, very excited and uh, looking very much forward to it. By three o'clock, everyone was at Kevin Sr.'s house, except Kevin. That's when they got a surprising text message from his wife, Morgan. It said, uh, sorry, due to unforeseen circumstances, we will not be able to make it today. Love you, happy Father's Day. That was it. The Father's Day party was spoiled, and Kevin's family knew it had something to do with Morgan. It always did. Their relationship was a roller coaster. It was them fighting, her saying that she hates him, I can't stand him, I'm leaving him, and then the next day, come over to the house and say, Kevin and I are going to the jewelry store, we're getting a new engagement ring. That's how up and down Kevin and Morgan's relationship was. <laughs> ah, love. Such a fickle little beast. When Kevin and Morgan first met 13 years earlier, they were great together. Morgan was a very loving, caring, pretty girl. And she bent over backwards for Kevin. She seemed like the ideal girlfriend to have. She seemed like a catch. But their relationship began to change when Kevin realized Morgan and the truth were not exactly best friends. Morgan! Morgan would lie about things that didn't need to be lied about. She would tell Kevin, yes, I paid the cable bill. And he would say, okay, great, the cable bill's paid. And then two weeks later, the cable gets shut off. And the lies just kept on coming. Morgan was arrested for shoplifting, writing her bad checks to the supermarket. It was just always something with Morgan that she did, a lie, a steal, a cheat. And it almost became regular for us friends to hear that Morgan had done something again. And the biggest doozy came after they'd been dating about a year. Morgan showed up for a family dinner looking suspiciously, well, not to be judgy, but a little chubby. We all kind of looked at Morgan and thought, wow, looking pregnant there to us. Finally, somebody said something to her about, geez, you look, you know, are you okay? Are you pregnant? No, no, I'm not pregnant, I'm not pregnant. I'm, you know, I'm just, you know, bloated, I guess. She was bloated, all right. Bloated with eight pounds of healthy baby girl. In fact, Morgan gave birth the very next day. Even when we went in to see her after she had the baby, she sat very nonchalant. You know, oh, yeah, well, I had a baby. And don't know what happened. That doctor told me I wasn't pregnant. I don't understand it at all. I don't understand how that happened. But it didn't matter to Kevin. He loved Morgan, and he loved being a father. Kevin was very happy to have a, a little baby girl. He held her with joy and loved her from day one. Kevin and Morgan got married. Then Kevin started a landscaping company. Morgan helped out with the business, and they had two more children. Where Kevin took a children first, Morgan took a Morgan first, children second. Morgan was into Morgan. <laughs> Morgan was a very self-centered person, so whatever pleased Morgan or made Morgan happy is what she did. And one of the things that made Morgan happy was having affairs with Kevin's friends. Kevin knew when he was crushed, he was hurt. It just destroyed him. But no matter what Morgan did, Kevin defended her and always forgave her. You know, she would go off with a guy, and when she wanted to show back up, she would show up and knock on the door, and he would open up the door and let her in. Kevin came from a divorce household, and it took a toll on him growing up. And I think Kevin was not going to allow that to happen with his family. He was going to keep his family intact at all costs. So when Kevin didn't show up at his dad's Father's Day party, and Morgan was the one sending the text, Kevin's family reached out to Kevin. They tried texting and calling, but Kevin didn't answer. That's when Kevin's family compared notes and realized no one had seen or talked to Kevin in days. Uh, 
that's not like him at all. Not his brother and sister, not his mother, no one. And his mother, he essentially talked to her every day, every day called her. So it was reason for us to be concerned. In fact, they were so nervous they called police and filed a missing persons report. What everybody thought was maybe something terrible had happened in the relationship and Kevin went off the deep end. The next day, police checked in with Morgan. She told them she wasn't the least bit concerned. She says, look, I have text messages from my husband. I have phone calls from my husband. He just took off. According to Morgan, their landscape business was in trouble. And poor Kevin just couldn't take the stress. Then she showed police a text she'd received four days earlier. I hate to do this to the kids, but I'm not happy. I don't want this life anymore. You can deal with the business however you want. It looked like nothing more than an unhappy man wanting a time out from his stressful life. So police didn't pursue an investigation. Kevin's family didn't believe he would walk away from his children. Something was definitely wrong. Hey, Kev, it's me. And so then we all began to call and text Kevin and say, Kevin, come on, let's talk. What's going on here? And we would get text messages back saying, I'm OK. I just want to be left alone. I told Morgan, take care of the business. I need to get away. Don't bother me. That was the answer we were getting. When Kevin's family tried to reach him by phone, calls went unreturned. But the texts kept coming in. Not hearing his voice made us nervous. And we thought, why can't he call us if he's OK? And there was something else. Kevin didn't sound like himself. Kevin's messages would be very short and brief. He would use uh, the letter U instead of Y-O-U, and he wouldn't use punctuation and proper grammar. And all of a sudden, it was always proper spelling, proper punctuation, and Kevin doesn't text like that. And Kevin wasn't the only one acting strangely. Just one week after Kevin disappeared, his wife, 34-year-old mother of three, Morgan, had a new live-in boyfriend. Steve Chappelle, a 21-year-old who worked for Kevin's landscaping business. The pretense was that Kevin wanted Uncle Steve, according to Morgan, to be there to watch over the kids while he was away. And it looked like Uncle Steve was really taking his new role seriously. He was seen holding Morgan's hand at her apartment complex pool and riding around in Morgan's truck, taking the kids out for ice cream. They acted as if they had been a couple forever. It was very bizarre. And the entire family just kept asking us, are, are you kidding me? I, I just can't believe this. So police brought Morgan's new boy toy in to have a friendly chat about why he was holding hands with the boss's wife. I said, it's not a crime to have an affair with a married woman, but it is a crime to lie to the police. And that's when he stopped and he paused for a moment. He says, OK, well, yeah, we are having an intimate affair. According to Steve, Morgan the Cougar came on to him. She would tell him how uh, handsome he was, and, and he fell for it. And they first had intercourse in a pickup truck at a job site, and then they had intercourse a couple times at the shop. And I asked him, I said, well, did Kevin find out about this? And no, 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 Kevin didn't find out. But now Kevin was missing, and detectives had an idea Steve might be leaving out a few details. I said, well, is it possible that Morgan did something to Kevin? And Morgan is going to set you up. She's going to say that you're having an affair with her. You fell in love with her, and something happened to Kevin. And she's going to blame this entire thing on you. And he starts to cry and tells me that he doesn't want to answer any more questions. Suddenly, Kevin's absence was looking a lot more suspicious. He had disappeared into thin air, and police would soon learn that's exactly where they had to look to find him again. Kevin Mangle of West Goshen, Pennsylvania, had vanished. But when police talked to Morgan, his wife of 13 years, she said Kevin couldn't take the stress of his life anymore and simply up and left. She had moved on too, 
Morgan was now living with her new 21-year-old boyfriend. But police believed there was more to the story, and so did Kevin's family. And when his mother got a text message from Morgan asking to take care of the children for a couple of days. Chris, come here a minute. Kevin's family was instantly suspicious. And my son Chris was there, and he said that she's getting ready to bolt. They knew Morgan better than we did, so they decided to sit on the apartment all night long. Early the next morning, Kevin's brother, Chris, spotted Steve leaving Morgan's apartment. That's him. He's walking out. He's got a bag. Morgan came out with more bags and carried them to her truck. They're getting yeah, in the truck now. Chris called the police. Can I get hold of Detective Maurer real quick? His wife and the new boyfriend are making a move right now to leave. They're leaving. They're leaving. Chris followed behind. But Morgan and Steve didn't go very far, only down the road to Kevin's landscaping business. As it happened, Detective Maurer was already there working a hunch. I was hoping maybe Kevin was sleeping in a shop at night and hiding from Morgan. And I look up, and in comes Morgan's pickup truck. Steve's staring straight ahead. And Morgan gets out of the pickup truck and walks right by and brushes by my shoulder. And I said, wow, that's. You know, that's, that's odd. As Detective Maurer turned to talk to Morgan, Steve took off. So I turned to Morgan. I said, what's going on? She has this dumbfounded look on her face. Things aren't looking too good with Steve, are they? And says, oh my god, maybe he did do something to Kevin. Detective Maurer immediately put out an alert for Steve and took Morgan to the police station to figure out what was going on. Steve has been staying at your place, but Kevin's your husband. Correct. Did you ever think that maybe Kevin would come home and Steve would be there and there would be an issue? No, I hadn't thought about that. Are you looking for trouble? No, I'm not. It's poor judgment. Poor judgment, but it also makes me think that somebody knew that Kevin wasn't going to come home. And Morgan wanted to make sure that police understood the somebody who knew Kevin wasn't going to come home was Steve Chappelle. Steve had said to me that he loved me and would do whatever it took to have me. Do you think maybe Steve hurt Kevin? Steve hit Kevin in the back of the head with a shovel. Did you catch that? Let's listen again. Steve hit Kevin in the back of the head with a shovel. Whoa, you know, I, I said, OK, why, why didn't you tell me this earlier? Are you trying to protect Steve? Not at this point. Were you? No. Then why wouldn't you tell me that stuff? I don't know. We knew something was seriously wrong. But we didn't know if Kevin was alive, if they had done something to Kevin. We, we didn't know what the story was. And Morgan wasn't very forthcoming. So police held her in an interview room while they contacted cell phone companies, hoping to track Steve by the GPS in his phone. They didn't find Steve, but they did discover an enormous amount of text messages between Steve and Morgan. These people text like they breathe. And there's thousands and thousands of text messages. Somewhere in that mass of data could be vital information about Kevin's disappearance, but getting at it seemed almost impossible. It was very confusing because text messages are not in chronological order with conversation. They're in chronological order by time. Police put together a team of officers. They spent hours sifting through the mountains of text messages. We began reading the conversations, and we were yelling them over the cubicles back and forth so that we could make sense of what it was that they were talking about. At first, they saw hints, glimpses of something dark and chilling. Then suddenly, it was uh, mid-afternoon when we had gotten to the point we were learning exactly what had gone on. And it wasn't good. Kevin Mengel had been a victim of foul play. And Steve Chappelle and Morgan Mengel's text messages were a literal play-by-play -play of the deadly plan. As a widow, Morgan would get everything, the kids, the company, and her freedom. And with Steve's help, she could make that happen. Morgan Mengel repeatedly told Stephen Chappelle 
that if Kevin would go away, that he could have the business and the two of them would be happy ever after. Using the text messages as a narrative, police could finally lay out the Lovebird's toxic plot. It started with research on the internet. That's where Morgan and Steve found the recipe for liquid nicotine. A few concentrated drops can be lethal. At 7.57 p.m. on June 19, 2010, Steve was at his mom's house, cooking up the nicotine. His sous chef, Morgan, checked in. Once Steve cooked the nicotine down, he put it into a bottle of Kevin's favorite iced tea. Then he gave it to Morgan. And then in the morning, puts it on Kevin's truck for Kevin to drink. Just as they'd hoped, Kevin drank the iced tea. Then he drank some more. Everything was moving along according to plan. Well, almost. After two hours, Kevin was still going strong. It wasn't fatal, but it was enough that it may have started to make him nauseous or feel lightheaded or something like that. They were still optimistic that their special recipe would do the job. But just in case, they had a backup plan. Unhappy with her marriage, Morgan Mangle recruited 21-year-old Steve Chappelle to help kill her husband, Kevin. They tried poisoning him by spiking his iced tea with liquid nicotine. It didn't work. That's when they switched to their backup plan. As Kevin is working on the hedge trimmer, Steve comes from behind and hits him over the head. Hits him hard enough, the shovel actually breaks in half. Kevin is still alive. He grabs a second shovel, hits him a second time, and a third time. That shovel also breaks in half. But at this time, he thinks Kevin is deceased. He, he stops breathing. steps right over her dead husband's body and gives him a kiss and starts giving orders. We got to clean this up, get a tarp, I'll turn the water on. This is what we're going to do. She then takes over. They wrapped the body in a tarp, tied it up with twine, and left it in the shop. Four days later, Steve drove the body to a wooded area and buried it. People sometimes miss understand who commits a murder. It's not always a cold-blooded TV type murder. Sometimes a murderer is, is, is a weak person. And Stephen Chappelle is a weak person that Morgan Mangle knew that, pushed his buttons, got him to do this crime. So while her young boyfriend was off burying her husband's body, Morgan was using Kevin's phone to text herself and Kevin's family and friends, trying to convince everyone that her husband had left her and her children to start a new life. She had her telephone and his telephone in the same vehicle, sending text messages back and forth to herself. She would use his telephone to text, then she would respond with her telephone. Morgan's cleverness didn't stop there. She thought that when she planned this crime out with her lover, that when she texted to him back and forth, that she could delete these texts. If only she'd been a bit more tech savvy, 
she would have known that the phone company had a record of every single text she'd sent and received. If she had been able to cover her tracks like that, who knows? And that brings us back to little liar Morgan at the police station, caught red-handed with her pile of very revealing texts. I told her that the game was over. I told her that we knew what had gone on. You have one last chance to tell us exactly what happened and what's going on. You know that we know. Somebody was killed. You understand that? Who is that person? Kevin. And Kevin who? Michael. And who is that person to you? My husband. Morgan was arrested on the spot. Her boy toy was caught only a few days later. He confessed everything. He was scared to death. He was super remorseful and cried the entire time, and you could barely, you could barely hear his voice. I snapped, and the next thing I knew, I had a shovel in my hand, and I swung it. But as soon as I realized what I did, I panicked. Steve Chappelle pled guilty to murder. He was sentenced to a minimum of 40 years. While in prison, he agreed to testify against the conniving cougar, Morgan Mengel. And given his damning account of what happened, Morgan took the prudent approach and pled guilty. I think she had a goal in mind, and she wasn't going to stop. I just am amazed. I am amazed. There, there, I've never, ever in my life thought that there was, could be a person as, as ugly as, as this person. There is no one colder in this world, in my mind, than that woman. There is no one. Pretty young, deadly things grow just about anywhere. And that brings us to our next story. This is Robinson, Texas, the kind of place where nothing much ever happens. But on November 9, 2005, the small town outside Waco was shaken to its core. The young woman calling 911 was 31 year old Darlene Gentry. This morning I was in my son's room because I didn't sleep. My back door was open. There's blood on the bed. He is struggling. The he she was referring to was her husband, Keith Gentry. And it appeared Keith had been shot. Officers raced to the Gentry home. We have a subject that has a gunshot wound. Time out, 612. When they arrived, they spotted guns lying on the front lawn. It appeared that there could have been a burglary gone wrong. Go check the inside. Go check the guy. Watch yourself going in. Robinson Police. I'm sorry, what? Stand right here and just keep scanning. Don't let anybody near them guns. Darlene met police at the front door and led them to her husband. 31-year-old Keith Gentry was unconscious, bleeding from a wound in the back of his head. Sir, can you hear me? He was alive, but didn't know how long Keith would survive the uh, wound that he received. Paramedics stabilized Keith and rushed him to the hospital. Police turned to Darlene, hoping to get to the bottom of what happened. Do you have any idea who this could have been? I have no idea. Okay, do you know which way they went? No, I saw nothing. You, do you hear a car drive off real quick or anything? I heard nothing. Poor Darlene Gentry. Her husband, Keith, was on his way to the hospital, and she might soon be a tragic young widow. This was not the way their love story was supposed to go. Darlene and Keith met when they were both in college. Darlene was a classic Texas beauty, a former high school cheerleader and homecoming queen. She was just very outgoing, just very friendly and talkative and nice. Keith was darkly handsome with an easy grin and a reputation as a ladies' man. Good girl, bad boy. Well, that's a story we all could tell. But back to Darlene and Keith. For them, it was love at first sight. My daughters and I thought that Darlene was the one for Keith. We tell everybody we had picked <laughs> for him. We loved Darlene, all of us did. But after dating Darlene steadily for months, Keith suddenly dumped her. 
I think it's a guy thing. <laughs> he wanted to date other people, maybe. Brokenhearted, Darlene moved to Dallas, leaving her dream man a hundred miles away. But like any good love story, this one looked like it was going to have a happy ending. A year after their breakup, Keith drove to Dallas, flashed that grin, and persuaded Darlene to come back to him. In 1999, they married. Keith was working as an architectural draftsman, and Darlene was a registered nurse. They seemed to have it all. It was just the two of them. They both had good jobs, and I think they were real happy because they were able to do whatever they wanted to do. Soon their happiness multiplied. Within four years, Keith and Darlene had three healthy sons, an idyllic life, now shattered by a gunshot in the night. At the local hospital, Keith was barely hanging on. While doctors worked to save his life, police were at his home trying to make sense of the crime scene, and it wasn't easy. There was no sign of forced entry and no explanation for the guns left on the front lawn. This didn't look like a routine burglary. And so we had a lot of unanswered questions. How did someone get in the house to steal weapons? And if they stole weapons, why shoot the, the man who was asleep? Something stinks about this, Gary. Something ain't right here, man, I'm telling you. And it appeared that the stink might be coming from Keith's loving wife, Darlene. Her attitude wasn't making any more sense than the crime scene. So police invited her down to the station. Just tell me in your own words, y'all's activity from last night to this morning. According to Darlene, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. She went to bed at 11.30 and two hours later awoke to one of her sons crying. He woke me up at 1.30. He had pooped in his diaper and wanted to be changed. And I know I did go out the side door to throw the poopy diaper in the black barrel out there like we always do. Then she came in and went back to bed. Honestly and truly, I don't remember if I physically locked the door back. So I'm not going to say one word or the other because I don't know. She fell asleep in the kid's room and she finally got up at 6 a.m. I got to the little foyer by our bedroom. I realized the gun cabinet was open, and there were no guns inside of it. And so then I screamed at Keith to tell him that his guns were not in the gun cabinet, that he needed to get up. But Keith didn't respond, so Darlene went into the bedroom. That's when she found him bleeding. You have your sleeper or what? Normally, I'm fairly... I'd say light just because of kids, but once they wake me up, I'm very light. But that first, when I go out, I'm out until I get woke up. So a two-year-old whimpering down the hall in a dirty diaper is enough to rouse Darlene. But a firearm blast just feet away, and she sleeps like a baby. Police weren't buying it. There had to be a gunshot that went off inside that house, and gunshots are loud. I, and that's what I keep trying to physically wrap my brain about. But the interview was cut short. Darlene needed to go to the hospital. Her husband was dying. And that meant police were no longer looking for a burglar. They were looking for a killer. And they suspected they already had her in their sights. A mysterious pre-dawn attack had left Keith Gentry with a bullet wound in the back of his head. Six hours after arriving at the hospital, Keith was pronounced dead. At his home, police were working what was now a murder scene, trying to piece together what happened. They focused on the guns inexplicably left in front of the Gentry house. Usually, if there's a burglary, the people take what they came there to take. Immediately, they're thinking, there's something really strange. Keith's father was on the scene. He confirmed for police that those guns were, in fact, his sons. But there was a problem. And I said, well, I see all of his guns, but I don't see the 22 pistol. He had a 22 pistol that I'd given him. And they said, well, it's not there. We looked in the vents. We looked under beds, under cushions, everywhere that we could think that somebody could place a weapon. 
they found no sign of the missing 22. But they did find a 22 caliber casing in the kitchen trash, wrapped up in a bloody surgical glove. And there was one person who was very familiar with using surgical gloves, who happened to live there. We all knew that Darlene Gentry was a registered nurse. It was time to bring Darlene back in to get some clarity. Do you keep a surgical glove? Yeah, I do, just because half the time they're in my pocket when I come home from work. Did you have any reason to throw any in the kitchen trash? I mean, not recently, I don't believe. And police were curious. Just how familiar was she with firearms? Have you shot a gun lately, or? I've never shot a gun in my life. Yeah. I've picked his guns up and things like that, but I've never physically shot it. And Darlene was hanging on to, I had nothing to do with my husband's murder, until the police asked her to sign a statement saying exactly that. Let's you look over that and read it before you sign it. I don't think I'm going to sign until I get an attorney so that way they can... I'm just not doing this alone because... It was finally dawning on Darlene that maybe police weren't totally buying the innocent act. Now, can I leave? Yeah. But once she requested a lawyer, the police had to let her go. Thank you for being so cooperative. <sighs> Five days later was Keith's funeral. For most, it was a sad affair. For Darlene, it was the perfect opportunity to break out that little black dress she'd been saving for a special occasion. And to the surprise of her in-laws, she rented a pina colada machine for the after-service gathering. The homecoming queen was back in town. Meanwhile, the mood was less festive down at the police station. Detectives were looking over the crime lab results and Darlene was in trouble. Remember when Darlene said, I've never shot a gun in my life. Not true, according to the gunshot residue found on her hands. And the bloody surgical glove from the trash can? There was DNA from Keith Gentry his blood on the outside of the glove, and on the inside of the glove was DNA from Darlene Gentry. Well, at this point, we became very focused on the possibility that Darlene Gentry had murdered her husband and had staged a, a burglary to try to cover up that murder. What we didn't know is we didn't know a motive. We didn't understand why. Police continued digging into Keith and Darlene's life. It soon became clear that what looked like the perfect couple was anything but. I mean, Keith and Darlene got along really good. After a while, things kept falling further and further apart. According to family and friends, Darlene began to change when she became a mother. The more children she got, she seemed to get more irritable. She didn't have the patience as the third one come along as she did with the first one. I do think that Darlene struggled with not being everyone's focus anymore. Once she had those three little boys, they were the focus. They were the focus of her in-laws and her friends and everyone. Didn't diminish anything about who she was, but maybe in her mind it did. So what did the homecoming queen turned average mother do? She started spending money like a movie star, hoping to buy that I'm someone special feeling. And it didn't come cheap. She drained the nest egg. Then she maxed out the credit cards. Police learned that Keith found out about Darlene's wild shopping sprees the day before he died. And when he came home, he said he had received two phone calls from different creditors, and he was not a happy camper. Police suspected her husband confronted her. Darlene! Furious, and it led to a terrible fight. And she devised this plan in her mind to murder him, and then she would be the beneficiary of any type of life insurance that, that he had. And even though she hadn't collected the money yet, 
Somehow it was burning a hole in Darlene's pocket. So just 14 days after burying her husband, Darlene was out shopping for a new home. Immediately, she found a prime piece of real estate on the outskirts of town. That's when she made a phone call back to ask if uh, the stock pond came with it. And uh, that's what I assured her it did. She said, this is great because Keith always wanted a place for his kids to go fishing. A tranquil pond, rolling hills, and lots of beautiful old oak trees. The ideal spot to build a new home and start a new life. But a few days after insisting the property was perfect, she called the land broker to say that tranquil fishing pond was an issue. She wouldn't buy the property unless the pond was filled in. The first thing that flashed in my head was, uh, you know, that's why she wanted it for her kids to be able to go fishing, and now she wants me to cover it up. But Darlene had no idea that her simple request had set in motion a high-stakes game of hide-and-seek that she wouldn't win. Less than two weeks after Keith Gentry was shot while he was sleeping at home in his bed, his wife Darlene was out shopping for a new piece of property. She found something she liked, but later raised suspicions when she told the land broker she'd only buy the property if he filled in the pond. The land broker called the Texas Rangers. Anyone who is raised in rural America would realize that a pond on a piece of land is an asset. They want ponds dug. They want ponds for the recreation use of it all. But nobody usually wants a pond filled in. A red flag went up. I knew that there had to be something in that pond that she didn't want somebody to find. And the first thing I thought of was that she's thrown that pistol in the pond. Police sent in a dive team to literally try and dredge up the truth. The divers did a walk through with their metal detectors. And that's when they heard that high-pitched buzz that told them they had a bite. They reeled in a 22 caliber pistol. Ballistic tests confirmed it was the gun that killed Keith Gentry. Now it was time to prove who put it there. Police asked the land broker to call Darlene and to tell her he was happy to accommodate her request. But first, he'd have to drain the water. She immediately began to get nervous. I mean, I could tell by her voice that uh, something was not right. Police moved into position. They placed a hidden camera in the woods focused on the exact spot where they recovered the gun. Then they waited. Ranger Cawthon stayed with the camera. I went out onto the highway and set up, waiting for her to show up. And sure enough, a Suburban showed up, which was the vehicle that Darlene normally drove. I contacted Matt by cell phone and said, she's at the scene, start the camera and leave which is what he did. And in the video, you can see Ranger Cawthon running off into the woods. A few moments later, there she was, Darlene Gentry, cheerleader, homecoming queen, wife, mother, and murderer. Why else would she be there unless she was the one responsible for disposing of the gun? Darlene came wearing rubber boots. Now watch. She walks around surveying. Then she wades into the pond, making her way to the exact spot where the Texas Rangers recovered the gun the day before. She appears to have some type of a long stick and begins probing around on the bottom of the pond an attempt to, to find something. But what the little fisher girl didn't know was more seasoned fishermen had already reeled in the prize catch. Don't you just love a good sting? 
That afternoon, Darlene was arrested. The sum total of evidence was overwhelming. Police believe the couple fought about money, then went to bed in separate rooms. Boy! But Darlene didn't sleep. In the middle of the night, she got out of bed, put on a pair of surgical gloves, opened the gun cabinet, and took out Keith's 22. Then she shot her husband point blank as he slept. She opened the revolver, pulled the spent shell out, and peeled off the gloves, keeping the casing inside. She then staged the crime scene to make it look like a burglar was responsible. At some point, she removed the gun from the house and dumped it into the pond. Police had Keith Gentry's killer. In February 2007, Darlene was put on trial for first-degree murder. I think that she thought when she got in front of the jury that she could just sit there and bat her eyes, and they would think never, never would this sweet little thing commit a crime like this. But they did. When two people marry, it's supposed to be a once-in-a-lifetime event. But some couples have to try a few times. Take Larry McNabney and Elisa Barrage. When they found each other, they had six marriages between them. So you would think they'd learned a thing or two of what it takes to make a marriage work. Sadly, some people never seem to get it right. This is probably one of the most cold and calculating cases where a woman has used her God-given resources to commit a crime and actually believe that they could get away with it. The story begins in 1995 in Reno, Nevada, at a time when the face of personal injury attorney Larry McNabney was everywhere. I've been a trial lawyer helping injured people for over 20 years. If you've been injured in an accident, you deserve and should demand experience. Larry's last line was always, uh, I'm Larry, Larry McNabney. McNabney. Call me, call me, call me. Larry was a local celebrity. He dressed like a cowboy, and people called him the Marlboro Man. Everybody seemed to like him. He was handsome, and he was charismatic, and funny, and had a lot of money, and he threw his money around. He, I mean, you had a great time with Larry. But Larry wasn't just a TV personality. He was a shrewd lawyer with a dark side. Through the years, he suffered bouts of depression and an addiction to alcohol. Larry often disappeared on benders for days or weeks at a time. Work would never know where he would be. Nobody would. And then he'd show up, and he'd be sorrowful and, and uh, get himself straightened out a little bit and try again. If you've been injured, you deserve confident legal help. Call me. Finally, in 1988, after time in rehab, Larry seemed to have his demons under control. That's when he met Cheryl Tangen. For seven years, they were in a stable and loving relationship. There was a lot of laughter coming home. He'd make dinner, he'd make his barbecue sauce at Christmas time. There were a lot of wonderful things in our lives. By the summer of 1995, every part of Larry's life was working well, including his law practice. In fact, business was so good, Larry decided to open a satellite office in Las Vegas, and he began hiring. That's when Elisa Barash walked through the door. A self-proclaimed workaholic, Elisa was 29, 17 years younger than Larry. Attractive, extremely personable, and she had an IQ of 140. She seemed perfect in every way. He was so excited about this new person that had come in, and he said, oh my goodness, she's got her MBA, she's brilliant, she's willing to spend 24-7 to help us get this business off the ground. 
Elisa seemed like a miracle out of thin air, and that's the way she liked it. Elisa never talked about any of her background. I couldn't have told you where she was from, you know, how many brothers and sisters she had, if she had any. And Larry was captivated by his new mysterious employee. Elisa had a power over men. And it wasn't just her physical attractiveness, but she had a smile, the way of looking at them, the way of making them feel they were the center of attention. She lit up a room, and I think she knew she had this power, and she certainly had it over Larry. Elisa proved to be everything she'd promised, smart, hardworking, and industrious. Within one week, Larry promoted her to office manager. Elisa whipped the office into shape and soon took control over all of Larry's business matters. And then she took control of Larry's heart. That's when he broke it off with Cheryl. Of course, I was devastated. So I stayed in the house for another, another couple of months, and he stayed in Vegas. By late fall, things were going great for Larry and Elisa, both at home and at the office. But soon there was a problem. Clients began calling with concerns about money missing from their accounts. Larry hired a CPA to audit the books and discovered that tens of thousands of dollars were unaccounted for. Really? That meant someone was stealing from under Larry McNabney's nose. All roads led back to his new star employee and love interest, Elisa. I got a phone call at Christmas, and it was Larry. And he was frightened, and he was devastated. No, no, I, I trust Elisa had embezzled $250,000 from the business. As if that wasn't bad enough, the money she embezzled put the Nevada bar at his doorstep. To save himself and his practice, Larry had to fire Elisa. But instead of asking her to pay him back for the thousands of dollars she stole, what did he do? He asked her to become his wife. Ain't love grand. I was shocked. I couldn't believe he would do that. He didn't know her very well. I'd never asked him why he married her. I never asked him. You know, there may have been a tinge of darkness to their relationship, but I think he was excited by that. And I think he found kind of a soulmate in a way, in a dark side. To keep his new wife happy, Larry let Elisa work quietly behind the scenes. But after two years of sneaking around, the couple finally had enough. In March 1998, Larry and Elisa closed the Nevada offices and opted for a fresh start in Sacramento, California, a state where Larry's law license was still in good standing, and she could openly work for him. The cowboy was back in business. I've been a trial lawyer so long, I can barely remember doing anything else. And I love what I do. If you've been injured, call me. And like Elisa had done in Nevada, she was handling legal matters as if she was an attorney, too. But Larry didn't care. He was happy. He loved his young wife, and he was making more money than he ever thought possible, which made Elisa happy. Elisa saw a great opportunity, and she certainly took advantage of it. She spent his money like crazy. There was a white Jaguar and a black Jaguar. And then at one point, he was talking to me about buying a private jet. It was just insane. And there were horses, too. Elisa had always hoped of owning one. And now, with all the money rolling in, she could have one or two very expensive ones. And this suited Larry, AKA the Marlboro Man, just fine. Soon they were winning high-end horse shows. And after years of being sober, even Larry was celebrating by drinking wine. He was enjoying his new life so much, he put his work on the back burner. He wasn't coming to the office. He wasn't uh, dedicating a lot of time to the law firm. Elisa could handle that, but she needed somebody else to help her out. That's when Sarah Dutra entered the picture. Sarah Dutra was a student at Sacramento University, early 20s, tall, blonde, played the piano, art student, well-poised. She was very smart. 
and became very tight with Elisa. I think Elisa saw herself in Sarah. And I think in a way, together, both of them thought that they were smarter than everybody around them. They thought that they were prettier than everybody around them. And when you get that, there's almost like a sense of, well, I can do anything and get away with it. And what they tried to get away with shocked everyone. <laughs> Larry McNabney was Sacramento's most well-known TV commercial cowboy. The problems you may face in your personal injury claim may be more complex than you realize. I know. I've been helping injured people for over 20 years. By 2000, the self-proclaimed Marlboro Man was spending most of his time taking care of his prized show horses. While his beautiful young wife, Elisa, who had no law experience, was running his office with the help of her new employee, Sarah Dutra. Something about their personalities just meshed. They just fed off of each other. It was symbiotic, codependent, whatever word you want to use to describe it. And Elisa and Sarah's business relationship quickly went from professional to personal. They brought out the best or worst in each other, however you look at it. They wore each other's clothes. They liked to dress up together and go out. They would party together. Uh, they would sleep in the same bed together. I mean, they were inseparable. As the months passed, Elisa and Sarah were having fun. They used Larry's money to buy themselves whatever they wanted. And when Elisa would join Larry at the horse shows, Sarah tagged along at the expense of Larry. Larry didn't like how close they were, and he wanted Sarah out of the picture. She was spending way too much time with his wife, Elisa, and Elisa was spending all of her time with Sarah, and he just didn't like what he saw. But Elisa didn't care. In early September 2001, she wanted to free up Sarah so they could spend even more time together and more of Larry's money. That's when Elisa decided to hire someone else to help run the office. 25-year-old Ginger Miller wanted the job. I loved Elisa the first time I met her. Very gregarious, outgoing, um, bubbly, personable, sweet, everything that you know you would really like in a person. Ginger was hired right away and scheduled to start a week later. In the meantime, Larry and Elisa traveled to Southern California for another horse show. Soon after, Sarah Dutra joined them. Over dinner and maybe a few too many glasses of wine, things finally boiled over. No, she can leave. Larry made some comment to someone else, and Sarah Dutra then said, F you, Larry, not using those words, but actually spelling out the word. And so there was this bad blood that night between the two of them. Oh, three is a crowd and always has been. So Larry was mad at Sarah. Elisa was mad at Larry for being mad at Sarah. So Elisa and Larry fought about Sarah. And then Sarah stormed out of the hotel and headed back to Sacramento. Larry had reached his breaking point and confided in his horse trainer about the whole mess. Larry said he didn't want Sarah coming around anymore. And when the trainer inquired and said, why, you know, she's Elisa's best friend, I thought you got along with her. He says, well, not anymore. And then he goes on to say that he's directed Elisa to fire her, get rid of her. In the meantime, Sarah talked to Elisa to try and figure things out. I think Sarah realized that, hey, this is the end of the road. Elisa's gonna have to let me go. And no more shopping sprees, no more nothing. That's when Elisa and Sarah really started to think outside the box. Sarah flew right back to the horse show that night. The next morning, the Larry, Elisa, and Sarah triangle became invisible because of world events. It was 9-11. 
That was probably why no one noticed that the vibrant TV cowboy, Larry McNabney, had suddenly become ill. So ill that his wife needed a wheelchair to get him through the hotel after checking out. Fortunately, her best friend Sarah was there to take care of the luggage. Back in Sacramento a week later, Ginger Miller arrived at the offices of Larry McNabney and Associates for her first day of work. No one showed up to greet me. So I waited for two hours in the parking lot. And then finally, Elisa called and said that Sarah was on her way. Sarah showed up an hour later. She didn't have her shirt all the way on. She had obviously probably like just woke up out of bed, actually. Sarah told Ginger to answer the phones. A few hours later, Elisa finally arrived, but there was no sign of Larry. Elisa said he was golfing up north. Then Elisa left Ginger to handle the office. Later that same day, an irate woman from a medical supply company in Los Angeles called. She was desperate to speak with either Elisa or Sarah. She says that they rented a wheelchair on like the 9th or the 10th and they never returned it and they need a $350 deposit immediately. But no one ever returned the woman's call. Later that week, Ginger was sent to the DMV. I was made to go get paperwork so that they could sell Larry's truck. He said he didn't want the truck anymore. So Larry was off golfing somewhere and he decided he didn't want his truck anymore. And judging by what was happening in the office, it looked like he was sick of signing his name on things, too. The checks, everything's forged to signature, so they're running the office as if he's there. Soon, Ginger found herself deeply involved in all kinds of business that didn't make sense. I was switching money from Larry McNabney and Associates, three different accounts, into a horse training company account that was owned by Elisa. And there was a lot more odd behavior, especially when it came to Larry. And then I'm told to tell three different lies to random different people about Larry's whereabouts. After two weeks of stories that constantly changed, Ginger became suspicious. Elisa somehow sensed Ginger's reservations and decided to open up. I come back from lunch and I see Elisa leaning over the desk, her head in her arms, weeping uncontrollably as if she had lost her own child. And she starts to tell me about how her marriage with Larry is horrible and that he's an alcoholic. He's actually at a rehab and she doesn't think she wants to make it work and that she says that being with him, being with an old man, touching his loose skin made her sick. Well, obviously, Elisa's wedding vows didn't include aging and loose skin. But let's not digress. So Larry was in rehab, and Elisa was trying to keep the company afloat while he was away. She was so supportive. Ginger wanted to help her new friend. She got right back to work covering for her absent boss, but not one to wallow in self-pity. Elisa's mood brightened considerably when she and Sarah decided to buy a new red Jaguar. And then they spontaneously left work early so they could drive to Reno and attend a party. Elisa said, well, maybe we should go get clothes. And then Sarah's like, no, why don't we buy some when we get there? And they're like, oh my god, awesome. We'll go buy matching boots, matching clothes. Weeks went by, and creditors were calling daily. But the spending spree continued. Ginger Miller would see them come in every day with these gorgeous new clothes and shoes and accessories and jewelry. And they traveled to all these different horse shows. And they'd go to these really nice restaurants. And wherever Larry was, he was footing the bill for all of it. And where was Larry? If he was in rehab, clearly it wasn't working. It had been more than a month, but no one seemed to care until his California license to practice law expired. No, 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 no! Elisa flipped like I have never seen anyone flip. Books started being thrown across the room. If 
Files started being thrown, ripped, pages ripped out, drawers dumped out on the floor, cussing and screaming. What the F are we gonna do? We don't have Larry. No Larry, no effing license. We are done, we are done. We have no money. We are effing done, you guys. And here's all of us kind of just silent. When she says there's no Larry, what are we effing gonna do? We're effing done. And I'm like, oh, well, there's my answer. There is no Larry. I'm Larry McNabney. Call me. Personal injury attorney Larry McNabney hadn't shown up for work at his law practice in almost three months. His wife, Elisa, said that he was in rehab. In the meantime, she and her best friend slash co-worker, Sarah Dutra, were spending his money like drunken sailors. That is, if drunken sailors like Prada and Gucci. Then there was the scene after Elisa realized her absentee husband's law license had expired. That's when their employee, Ginger Miller, quietly went to police. I said, my boss has been missing since September, and I know his wife did something, and I think the secretary helped. And then about 20 minutes later, I go upstairs into an office, and there's a whole crew of people and a bunch of tape recorders set up, and I'm interviewing until nightfall. Ginger recounted every detail, from the money being moved around in bank accounts to the medical company looking for the wheelchair. Message after message after message stacked up, and ladies start to yell at me. Did you ever confront him about the messages or tell them? I'm like, I'm like, man, that someone called about a wheelchair and said you owe 500 something dollars. I said, but you know, she's hella rude to me. And then he says like, oh, well, I'll take care of it later. And then there were the countless reasons for Larry's absence offered up by Elisa and Sarah to family, friends, and clients. Sarah Dutra and Elisa McNabney were answering the phone and giving contrasting explanations as to where Larry was. Well, he's at a rehab clinic. He's gone off to do yoga. He's at an alcoholic center. He's at a retreat. He's at a conference. He joined a hippie commune. He's in Costa Rica. Hearing these different answers made her very suspicious. Ginger also told police that Elisa and Sarah were spending the money that was coming in from insurance companies. Ginger was being directed to tell the clients that their cases were still continuing when she, in fact, knew had been settled and the payment from the insurance companies had been received. Their looks on their faces and their expression and their attitudes showed that this was something real. So she's moving money from one account to the other account? Uh -huh. And sometimes she just send me down a check for like a thousand dollars, maybe a couple hundred sometimes, or she just wanted the cash. I felt like someone now knew. I felt such a huge relief. Detectives needed to investigate Ginger's allegations, but they didn't want to tip off Elisa and Sarah. So they asked Ginger to return to the office as if nothing had happened to help them gather information. I was talking to the police every chance I got throughout the day. Ginger gave detectives names and addresses of Larry's clients, and everyone police talked to said the same thing. No one had seen or spoken to Larry in months. But before the police could act, they needed solid proof that Elisa and Sarah were somehow involved in his disappearance. As it turned out, Elisa was the one to make the next move. Hello? On January 11, 2002, Elisa McNabney called Ginger Miller before dawn. She said, can you come earlier today because we're moving to Arizona? Nothing like hearing from your boss about a spur-of-the-moment move to get your day going. When Ginger arrived at the law office, Elisa was putting things into boxes, but Sarah was nowhere to be found. I have pretty much anxiety the whole time, and we're packing up so she can skip town, and I'm alone packing with her. Then they headed to Elisa's horse trailer. It was kept at a nearby storage facility. They were in two separate cars, so Ginger had a minute to make a quick call to police. And they said, as soon as you start to drive off, let us know we're going to be waiting to pounce on her. But first, Ginger had to go through with the charade of helping Elisa. 
When she arrived at the trailer, there were no horses in sight, just Elisa's personal belongings thrown everywhere. Elisa was obviously using the trailer as her moving van. And when everything was finally loaded in, Ginger said goodbye. I pulled out and I got about half a mile down the road and called the police and then I saw them all fly past me. But the trap didn't work. Somehow, Elisa saw the police coming. They came in through the front and Elisa took off in her red Jaguar out the back. This is the stuff that legends are made of. Elisa appeared out of nowhere and poof, disappeared the same way. Too bad the horse trailer with all her stuff hadn't gone poof, too. Because buried in that untidy packing job were clues that led to the shocking truth behind Elisa's mysterious past. If you've been hurt in an accident, the smart thing to do is to hire a lawyer who can take care of business. I can do that. By early January 2002, attorney Larry McNabney had not been seen in months. His wife Elisa and her best friend Sarah, who were inseparable, were telling family, friends, and clients varying stories as to his whereabouts. Then suddenly, Elisa McNabney said she and Sarah were moving to Arizona. But Elisa drove into the sunset in her very expensive Jaguar, alone. Sarah Dutra goes to the Sacramento airport and she thinks there will be a plane ticket there for her to fly to Arizona. And she gets to the airport and it's not there. Well, there must be a mistake. And it was only after making a number of calls that she realizes there's no plane ticket for me. She's been abandoned. But not for long. Sarah had new people interested in spending time with her. The police. Okay. I'm telling you, though, I have not heard from her. I swear to God. When we spoke with Sarah, she gave us a pretty kind of benign interview, didn't know where Elisa was, and that all she knew that was that Larry had left Elisa and he was gone. I said, was he coming back? And she said, I don't know. I don't know if he's coming back. We could detect that there was a sense that she was trying to detach herself from Elisa. She was making it sound like it was a boss employee relationship and that she didn't really know any of the personal details or, or things of that nature, which we knew from the beginning that that was not right. Sarah, I want to talk to Elisa. I want to talk to her now. The best thing you can do is tell us where Elisa's at. But if I don't know, I can't tell her. I mean, I don't even know how to start looking for her. But since this was just a missing persons case, actually two missing people, and there was no concrete evidence that a crime had been committed, police had to let Sarah go. At least until they could talk to Elisa. There was all of a sudden this urgency to find her. We had a vehicle we had to make, we had the vehicle description, and we put out a, a bulletin, be on the lookout for that vehicle. In the meantime, detectives returned to the horse trailer Elisa left behind. They combed through the jumble inside, looking for anything that could tell them where Elisa and Larry might be. After hours of searching, they found a stack of documents. It was a gold mine. It seemed that the mysterious Elisa Barash McNabney was not who she claimed to be. She had a 114-page rap sheet. And prior to Elisa McNabney, she had used 38 different names. And one of the names she used was Elisa Barash, the same name as a woman who lived in Florida. Police wanted to see if there was a connection, so they paid the second Elisa a visit. Hello, ma'am, how are you doing? And wait till you hear this. When they showed the second Elisa a photo, she recognized the other Elisa immediately. Only the other Elisa's name when she knew her was Lauren Sims. The two women had spent time together 11 years before when they were cellmates in prison. Lauren Sims grew up in Brooksville, Florida, and it's the type of town where everybody knows everybody. Lauren was a, a straight-A student. 
but she wasn't a person that could sit still, so she dropped out of high school. She had a good family, but for some reason she uh, removed herself from that. The people that knew her the best always felt like she couldn't wait to get out of there. She started off being a runaway. She would assume somebody's identity, maybe get a credit card, uh, go on the spending spree. She was arrested a few times. Forgery, burglary, some financial, non-sufficient funds type of offenses. Eventually, she was sentenced to state prison. That's where Lauren Sims met Elisa Barrage. And once Lauren got out of prison, she stole Elisa's identity. Then she made her way west. By the time she ended up at Larry McNabney's law firm, she'd already been married and divorced twice. And despite what she told Larry, she never got an MBA or even a college degree. But she never lied about her high IQ. And it served her well when it was time to manipulate the people around her. She could speak and be articulate and be around attorneys. Some of these attorneys would turn to Larry and would say how impressed they were with some of her arguments with no uh, formal uh, education, no uh, legal uh, training whatsoever. But now Elisa slash Lauren and her husband Larry were missing. And so was all the money his law firm had taken in for clients. And it was at least a half a million dollars and probably more actually, but they went through a lot of money. And what of Larry? The last time he'd been seen was at the horse show in Southern California. Somewhere around 9-11, Elisa and he checked out of the hotel. But everyone was focused on the breaking news, so no one could remember seeing them leave. But sometimes, buried secrets have a way of resurfacing. February 5th, 2002, some farm workers were crossing a vineyard in the Sacramento region, and they saw a portion of lower leg had been unearthed, and the sheriff's office responded out there and found a body uh, buried in a shallow grave. That body was Larry McNabney's. Larry's body looked like it had been in the ground only a short period, a matter of weeks, maybe a month or so. So the forensic anthropologist and the coroner speculated that the body had been kept preserved somewhere until just before it was put in the ground. When the doctors performed the autopsy, there was no trauma to the body. So there was no obvious signs of death. Initially, the pathologist did a screening for all the known poisons. It came back negative for all those. The mystery deepened. Who or what had killed Larry McNabney? And where was his missing wife? Police believed Elisa's best friend, Sarah Dutra, probably had more information than she'd previously told them. They brought her back in for more questioning. I'm here because Lawrence McNabney was found in a hole. He's dead, all right? That's why I'm here. I thought you meant, like, you were... Sarah, you better think about what's going on and your association to Elisa. You're into your eyeballs with all the financial stuff. We know that you were signing McNabney's name. She's given all this stuff away. You're helping clearing out offices. I believed her. Sarah, how old are you? 21. You're going to college, correct? Mm hmm You're not that dumb. Sorry. What I'm concerned with is the fact that you were too all fired surprised when I said he was dead. You should be covered up like this. What? You recovered from the fact that uh, Larry McNabney's dead really quick. I'm sick right now to think that Larry McNabney is dead. And who would do that to Larry? Who would do it? Who do you think would do it? Who do you think did it? I don't know who would do that. What I mean, makes the most sense? Sarah, come on. Elisa? I mean, that's the only person now I could think that would do that. I'm starting to wonder if I don't know Elisa as well as I thought I did. Yeah, and that I had really all this crap pulled over my eyes and I didn't know. 
No matter what Sarah told them, detectives still believed she was involved in the death of Larry McNabney, but they had nothing to hold her on. They let her go again. But three weeks later, the investigation took a turn when police in Florida located Elisa's car. A gentleman notified the Fort Walton Beach Police Department that his truck had been stolen by a lady who stayed with him. And when the officers initially went to take the report of the stolen truck, Elisa's Jaguar was located at that area. That meant the woman who stole the truck was most likely Elisa. The authorities found the pickup truck in the parking lot near a beach. They started combing the beach. And within a few minutes, uh, Elisa actually walked up to them and said, I'm the person you're looking for. Well, that was easy. After weeks of searching for Elisa, it looked like all they had to do was take a walk on the beach, and like magic, she'd appear. But that was only the beginning of the surprises she had up her sleeve. Now that Elisa had come forward, she was ready to reveal the truth about what happened to her husband, Larry McNabney. Attorney Larry McNabney had been missing. After five months, his body was discovered in a shallow grave in a vineyard near Sacramento, California. He was last seen with his wife Elisa and her best friend at a horse show near Los Angeles. Elisa had been missing for a few weeks, but police had finally tracked her down in Florida. The Florida authorities, along with the FBI, spoke with her. She was very forthcoming and just uh, immediately confessed. Did I kill my husband? Yes, I killed my husband. Well, there it was. Elisa slash Lauren had killed Larry. But how? She claimed that she and Sarah had poisoned him using horse tranquilizers. In the horse showing field, they carry these horse tranquilizers because when horses are transported to these horse shows, they get very antsy and frequently a veterinarian needs to tranquilize them for the trip. So horse tranquilizers relax horses, but when taken by humans, they can be deadly. That takes us back to the last time Larry was seen at the horse show in Southern California. Remember, Larry and Sarah had a huge argument. Sarah had stormed off, and Larry told Elisa he was going to fire Sarah. Elisa was furious with Larry. She called Sarah and convinced her to return to the horse show the following day. Then Larry disappeared. We went down to my trainer's truck, and I got the medicine bag out, and I got the tranquilizer out of it, and I got a syringe, and I said, I don't know how we're going to give it to him. And Sarah said, put in the visine bottle. So we squirted all the visine out of the visine bottle, and we stuck the syringe in there and filled it up. They took the horse tranquilizer medicine, and while Larry slept, they put drops of the horse tranquilizer into his mouth, which basically paralyzed him. Put like three drops in his mouth, and then I got all freaked out, so Sarah put some in there. But Larry was a big guy, so he didn't die right away. So then we got scared, and we put the in the Elisa and Sarah knew they couldn't leave Larry half alive in the hotel room. So they rented a wheelchair to move him. Because it was 9-11, no one saw them take him away. And we pulled him out to my truck, and we drove. With him in the back seat? Yeah. But the cowboy didn't go down without a fight. And Sarah's trying to hold him in the back seat because he's trying to jump into the front seat. And then proceeded to give him more horse tranquilizers to calm him down. I can't imagine a worse way to die because Larry's mind is still working and he's sharp, but his body is paralyzed. On the 385-mile-long drive from L.A. to Sacramento, Elisa and Sarah decided to take a side trip to beautiful Yosemite National Park, a place where Sarah spent many lovely summers as a child. They got out of the truck in Yosemite 
as Larry is comatose almost. But they start digging so they can bury Larry. She was gonna throw him in the hole alive. Yeah. I said, we can't put him in there, he's alive. We can't do that. Just so we're clear, it was okay to kill Larry, but burying him alive was a no-no. So what was plan B? To drive dying Larry back to Sacramento, where they gave new definition to the expression, clean murder. We both took him upstairs, and I took his clothes off, and I bathed him. I thought you guys wanted to kill him. Uh, I don't know, I'm kind of confused here. I don't know, it just, you have to understand that we were like, what are we doing, you know? So did you guys end up deciding? We fell asleep, and then I woke up. The two women had killed the Marlboro man, but they needed to do something with the body. And these two were nothing if not resourceful. In my garage, we had this blind refrigerator, so we took the line out of it and put it in the refrigerator. How long was he in the refrigerator? Three months. Three months in the refrigerator? Oh, God. It seemed like a good idea at the time, you guys. Oh, my God. So according to Elisa, she just got caught up in the moment. Larry is dead in the house, in the refrigerator, and they are draining his law firm dry. After months of living wildly and keeping up the pretense that Larry was still alive, Elisa decided to get rid of her husband once and for all. She got up before dawn. Elisa wanted private time. This was going to be her last road trip with Larry. She drove to a vineyard 15 miles away. Elisa made a comment that she had buried him there because he always loved wine. How thoughtful. Elisa kills her alcoholic husband, then digs a hole next to some nice wine grapes to bury him. A word to the wise, 2002 might not be the best year for Central California Merlot. How deep a hole did you dig? Not deep enough, obviously. And speaking of holes, Elisa had just dug another one. This time, she was the one she was burying. I know I'm going to spend the rest of my life in prison or go to the electric chair or whatever they do to people. I mean, I'm, I know that. I know that I did this, and I know that I'm guilty, and I'm prepared to deal with the repercussions of it. I believe that Elisa was the mastermind in this murder of her husband. I believe it was premeditated all the way back to the time when Sarah Dutra first came on board as a friend of hers, and they believed that they could continue to run the law offices and continue to bring in income and benefit each other and continue their friendship easier without him being in the picture and nobody would be any smarter. The police now had the complete story. A beautiful con artist finds a wealthy husband and uses him in every way to live the life she'd always dreamed of. But now it was over. I think Larry was self-destructive and then he found this woman who was also self-destructive in a way. And together, they destroyed each other. On March 21st, 2002, Elisa was taken to Hernando County Jail to await extradition to California. After a lifetime of slipping away when the heat was on, it looked as if the master escape artist was caught at last. But then Elisa surprised everyone when she pulled her ultimate and final disappearing act. When a marriage goes awry, and sadly many do, 
it's only natural to wish the ex away. But some women actually make it happen. I believe that she was a meticulous killer, that she was very manipulative, that she was used to getting her way. And these sinister magicians use every trick in the book to untie the knot. From a suburban working mother. Inside the suitcase was the head and torso of a white male. Oh, hot the chance! To a rural country wife. We don't believe it was a crime of passion at all. It was premeditation. There was a lot of thought given to this prior to the actual act of murder. These ruthless killers stopped at nothing to make their husbands disappear. Is there anything else you're not telling people? Like what? Like I killed my husband. This is Deadly Wives. Corbett, Oregon, gateway to the Columbia River Gorge, a magnificent stretch of wilderness along the Oregon-Washington border. The people here are a different breed. They live off the land, eat what they kill, and don't ask for anything from anybody. All right, praise the Lord! But on one wet, cold February morning in 2009, Corbett housewife Lynn Stomps was desperate for help. Two guys were driving down the road um, on Gordon Creek, and one of them saw a hand and an arm sticking out of the side of the road and pulled over to check it out and saw a human laying there trying to crawl up a bank. Lynn Stomps told the Good Samaritans that she and her husband Jerry had been attacked that morning by two strangers. One of the strangers threw her down into the water below. There's a, a woman been thrown off the bridge at Garden Creek. What do you mean she was thrown off the bridge? Somebody threw her off the bridge. She can't move her legs. Did she tell you that somebody threw her? Yes. OK. She did. Within minutes, help arrived. While paramedics worked on Lynn, she told detectives what had happened. Lynn Stomps and her husband, Jerry Stomps, went down to the river early that morning to meet a gentleman named Dave, who was interested in buying their boat. According to Lynn, Dave was some guy who had answered their online ad. She said Jerry thought it would be a good idea to meet Dave down by the river and get in a little fishing together before negotiating the price of the boat. Lynn Stomps told us she never wanted to go fishing that day. She just went with him to go with him. Dave showed up at the appointed time, and he and Jerry took off down the path. Lynn stayed behind in the truck. When she got out to stretch her legs... She hears her husband, Jerry, yell, run, run, and to get away. So Lynn starts running away down across this bridge over Gordon Creek. And just then, Lynn said a second stranger appeared out of nowhere and grabbed her, then threw her over the side of the bridge, a drop of about 20 feet. And when she hit the bottom, she knew she was injured, and it took her a couple hours, according to her, to crawl back on her hands and knees up the side of the embankment and try to flag down someone for help. Lynn said she was frantic to make sure her husband was OK. But by the time she reached the road, there was no sign of the man who had attacked her, no sign of Dave, and no sign of her husband, Jerry. There could have been an abduction, a kidnapping, a possible murder. So how long was this Lynn said she feared the worst, that something terrible had happened to the man she'd loved for as long as she could remember. Lynn met Jerry years before. She was from California, and he was a local Oregon farm boy just back from Vietnam. They shared a love of the outdoors and the simpler things in life. When they got married in 1971, everyone said it was a match made in heaven. Soon they had two boys. Jerry worked in the warehouse of a big name supermarket chain and Lynn stayed home and raised the kids. 
My mother was uh, your typical housewife from like the 50s, you know, she stayed home. She always made sure the house was clean, the kids were clean, prepared all the meals. Oh, pots and pans! The Stomps were a traditional family with traditional values. Both my parents were church-going folks. They believed in the Ten Commandments. They taught us from early age what was right and what was wrong. When the boys were in their teens, Jerry and Lynn fulfilled their dream of living a more simple life. They bought a 14-acre farm in Corbett, a tight-knit community east of Portland, Oregon. They raised livestock and ran a U-cut Christmas tree farm. It was a big pole barn. They sold Christmas tree ornaments and hot chocolate, muffins, and everybody would come around to go out and cut their Christmas trees. Lynn and Jerry were so proud of the way they lived they shot some home movies, hoping they might become reality stars. Hi, I'm Jerry Stomps. Come with me as we go hunting black bears with Jerry Stomps. Lynn was happy to stay behind the camera on these shoots. I suggest that you're serious about getting the bear. Do not, I repeat, do not put cologne on. Hunting wasn't really her thing. I remember as a kid, my dad tried to teach my mother how to shoot and she dropped the rifle when it went bang. The noise scared her, and she never did it again. But Lynn was happy to skin, butcher, and cook anything Jerry killed. She was a true country wife with a heart of gold. She delivered food to the needy, firewood for people who didn't have money for electricity. I had friends who uh, grew up in not quite ideal circumstances, and they always were over the house. Mom was always bringing in stray kids. We are all on film, so don't for 38 years, the Stomps were happy, and Lynn and Jerry's marriage was rock solid. They were always affectionate to each other, from as far back as I can remember. My parents didn't drink, they didn't do drugs, they didn't have affairs, they both didn't believe in divorce. You know, marriage was for life. But now that life was shattered. Lynn was in the hospital being treated for a fractured rib and a broken pelvis. And county search and rescue teams were mobilized to look for Jerry and the mysterious men Lynn said had attacked them. We used canines, we used horses, we even used air support. We used several dozens of ground pounders, we call them, people on the ground, searching the entire area near Gordon Creek. Lynn and Jerry's two grown sons were searching, too. I knew the area real well. The only person who knew the area better than me was my father. So we started searching all the back roads, all the gravel roads, any road, goat trail, whatever, and we could not find anything. It's just like he'd been picked up by aliens or something. And a possible alien abduction on Gordon Creek Road was perhaps more plausible than the story detectives were about to hear. On February 6, 2009, Lynn Stomps was in an Oregon hospital with a fractured rib and a broken pelvis. Her husband, Jerry, was gone. According to her, he was abducted by two strangers who had attacked them after pretending they wanted to buy Jerry's boat. This is not a part of the world where things like this happen, so Oregon search and rescue teams were out in force. We had 12 to 15 detectives, criminalists, other assets at our disposal to use and investigate. The harder you run at something with that amount of resources, it usually gets solved quite a bit quicker. And time was of the essence. The minute Lynn was out of surgery, detectives were in her hospital room trying to figure out what happened to Jerry. But Lynn didn't seem to sense the same urgency as the detectives. She cracked a few jokes. It just seemed a little different for somebody going through the experience she just went through. Detectives tried to get Lynn to focus on what may have been Jerry's last few minutes alive. But the more they questioned her, the less the story made sense. Starting with, why was the couple even on that lonely road to meet Dave, the potential boat buyer? That was strange, that they would go meet someone at the river that early in the morning to talk about a giant fishing boat that they want to sell that's actually up on their property five miles away. Lynn said they met at the creek because Jerry didn't want a stranger on their land. 
Right. Much safer to meet on a lonely road in the middle of nowhere than at your house, where you have an arsenal of handguns and hunting rifles. And then there was this. The way Lynn described her husband being taken, there's going to be some kind of uh, forensic activity that we're going to find down at the scene. Multiple footprints, areas where people would be sliding around, possibly fighting, drag marks. We didn't find that. I believe that my father, without a doubt, would have been carrying his firearm, and he would have proceeded to have a firefight right there to preserve my mother's life. At this point, to say Lynn's story was questionable is an understatement. Even her injuries were suspicious. Yes, she had a broken pelvis, but it looked like it was not from plunging over that bridge. The way she described it happened, doctors knew that it couldn't have happened that way. There were no bruises, there was no major marks, there was nothing that would indicate she suffered a fall off a 25 to 30 foot bridge. What was true was that Jerry was gone. And so was the mysterious boat buying Dave and his no-name wife-tossing accomplice. Detectives needed more to go on to find these guys. So one day after Lynn was found crawling up the embankment, detectives brought in a forensic artist. The idea was to create composite sketches of the attackers that could be distributed by the media. We started with a man who threw her over the embankment. I said, OK, Lynn, what can you remember? And she just was trying to describe this guy so general that I was not getting any kind of person in my head. So this is a to help, Lynn was given a facial ID book. It's little mug shots where part of the face is blotted out so that you're just seeing features and not whole faces. A truthful person would be just pouring through that book three or four times because there's an urgency. My husband of 39 years is missing, and we need to get him back. But for some reason, poor dear Lynn with a broken pelvis and a missing husband didn't seem all that interested. In fact, Lynn was a little bored with the whole process. At one point she goes, is my chapstick over there? Which is fine, but I had to remind her, your husband is missing. So I would appreciate it, and I'm sure Jerry would appreciate it, if you worked a little harder. So Lynn focused. And after half an hour working with Joyce, this is what she came up with. That's right. This is the face of her attacker. We had hair, a face shape, some shading on the face shape, and a mustache, collar of a shirt. That's what we had. Yeah. I asked her if she could remember anything more. She told me no. She said, that is all I can remember. Here's a little insider information about forensic art. Typically, if somebody is threatening you, you're, you're going to pretty much remember the face. And there was something else. While she was describing this guy, she compared part of him to her husband. Well, he had a mustache like my husband had. She started talking about Jerry in past tense. That's a bigger red flag, because that means he's already gone. And the flags just kept getting bigger and redder. When Lynn switched to describing Dave, she seemed to remember quite a bit more about his face. Typically, I do one sketch in about an hour to two hours. We took all of 20 minutes on that sketch. So that means that she's kind of making it up. Here's something you might not know. If someone is helping to create a sketch with a police sketch artist, and they don't have a real person in their mind, Sometimes they'll subconsciously describe their own face. Here's the composite sketch of Dave, and here's Lynn. At that point, my heart just sunk because I knew this guy was dead. And it looked like his dear wife, Lynn, knew a lot more than what she was saying. There were so many holes in her story at that point where we're focusing either on her or someone she's covering up for. It was time to take a harder look at Lynn. Detectives got a search warrant for the Stomp's home and farm. They wanted to check out that online ad to see if there were any emails from Dave. We were able to verify that no email had gone back and forth between Dave and uh, the Stomp's regarding the sale of the boat. 
Lynn's story was unraveling by the minute, and it looked like she had, too. The place was a mess. My mother was a very neat and clean, you know, like almost OCD about keeping the house clean. So that was a little odd. The Betty Crocker housewife had left her home a mess to meet non-existent strangers to go fishing but never fished, and got thrown off a bridge but didn't get bruised, and then described herself when she meant to describe the man who took her husband. And now her husband Jerry was nowhere to be found. What detectives needed was a break. Then they spotted an innocent little fanny pack. And that's when the investigation heated up. But no one knew just how hot it was going to get. A week before Valentine's Day 2009, Lynn and Jerry Stomp's picture-perfect marriage looked like it may have come to an end. Lynn was in the hospital after claiming she and Jerry had been attacked by two strangers. One man threw her off a bridge, and another man disappeared into the woods with her husband. Search and rescue teams were looking for Jerry, and detectives were looking for clues. At the Stomps family farm in Corbett, Oregon, they found a game changer. One of our sergeants located a fanny pack on the coat tree right near the front door. Inside the fanny pack was a gun. Jerry's son, Jason, recognized it immediately. It was his father's favorite. I had a horrible gut feeling that something was wrong, because my father never went anywhere without a firearm. Upon further examination of that gun, we looked in and we found that two cartridges had already been fired. Our criminalist took the gun back to her lab and was able to look at it in a high-powered light and determine there was blood spatter on that gun, where you're only usually going to get blood spatter when a gun is at close range. The police started to suspect that the blood spatter was from Jerry Stomps. They sent it out for testing. Then they continued their investigation of the Stomps' property. A search and rescue dog in the back of the house alerted by a burn pile. At that point, I called the detectives over and said, hey, we have kind of an issue here. A team of criminologists got on their hands and knees and meticulously combed through the pile. They started finding bone fragments. Made sense. Remember, Jerry was a hunter. What didn't make sense? The vertebrae they uncovered in a trash can next to the pile. Police sent the bones to the crime lab for analysis. A few days later, the results came back. The blood that was found on the pistol that was hanging in the Stomps' house was human. And fragments of bone that were located in the burn pile at the house were, in fact, human. And the human they belonged to? Jerry Stomps. As for the vertebrae in the trash can, that was part of Jerry's spinal column. It was apparent to the police that the story Lynn told them was a lie. Clearly, Jerry hadn't been abducted by the river. He'd been murdered at home. And someone went to a great deal of trouble to get rid of his body. My partner and I went to the hospital and go over all this information with Lynn. Very soft, very, let's figure this out. Tell this again how this happened. It wasn't an accident. Give Lynn some kind of reason to tell us that, OK, he beat me up. He did something to me. I had to shoot him. Whatever it was, um, she, she didn't take that opportunity. She still maintained that she had nothing to do with it. So police dug deeper into Lynn's life. They soon learned that the perfect country housewife liked to spend money, but her thrifty husband did not. So Lynn got her own credit cards and racked up more than $50,000 of debt. And the more debt Lynn got in, the more unstable she and her marriage became. Suddenly, Lynn and Jerry were arguing like never before. And then she did the unthinkable. Lynn shot him twice. Then Lynn got rid of his body. It takes a lot of heat, a lot of time to burn a body as she burned Jerry's. We also know through statements from other people, she even asked some renters on the property if they had things to burn. 
She needed more things to fuel this fire. She also needed a cover story for Jerry's disappearance. And that's how she ended up at the Gordon Creek Bridge. Lynn walked down below the bridge to go plant the fishing pole that she wanted us to find so she could report her husband missing. She slipped, fell, and injured herself. Police believe when Lynn fell, she broke her pelvis. She was in trouble, and she needed to crawl up the embankment to get some help. During the long, slow climb, she came up with the story of Dave and his faceless friend. That was her one flaw in her master plan. If Lynn would have gotten back to the truck, taken her backpack, and walked home, she would have made the phone call from her house saying, my husband went fishing this morning. I haven't seen him since. He's missing. We go down and we look for him at the river. There's not much of a reason that we would be up searching hands and knees on her property for him if he's a missing fisherman. On January 11, 2011, Lynn Stumps went on trial for the murder of her husband, Jerry. She maintained her innocence, but no one was buying it. And at the time of the trial, we were convinced that my mother had something to do with my father's demise without a shadow of a doubt. And the jury thought so, too. On January 24th, 2011, Lynn Stomps was found guilty of the murder of her husband. She had wrote me a letter after she got convicted and still said that she was innocent, she didn't do this. And I just told her I didn't want no contact with her unless she was going to tell us what happened. The only people who know what happened on that day is my mother and my father. But stories of husbands disappearing are not restricted to the quiet countryside. No, sometimes they happen right in the middle of suburbia. They say Virginia is for lovers, and what the people of Virginia Beach love is the water. The most notable landmark is a giant statue of Neptune, he towers over the boardwalk, gazing out on the beautiful Chesapeake Bay. Neptune generally keeps the mysteries of the sea to himself. But on May 5th, 2004, a terrible secret rose up from the deep. A couple of fishermen were enjoying the cool spring morning weather on a boat. They saw something in the distance. As they got closer, they realized it was a suitcase. The men reeled it in, hoping they'd discovered a valuable treasure. Instead, they got the surprise of their lives. And there they found a pair of legs of a white male. That's it, just legs, cut off above the knee. The shocked fishermen brought their grisly find to the police. But there was no way to know who the legs belonged to or where they had come from. Six days later, a second suitcase, same brand, washed up on shore at a nearby nature preserve. Inside the suitcase was the head and torso of a white male. Police now had the upper and lower parts of what appeared to be the same person. On May 16th, a third suitcase turned up less than a mile from where the first two had been discovered. The suitcase contained the pelvis of a white male. Police now had the complete body of one man. All of the dismembered parts found in the same type of suitcases wrapped inside the same type of black plastic trash bag. His body wasn't clothed except for underpants. There was no identification. There was, there was no nothing. The medical examiner determined that the victim had been shot at least twice with 38 caliber wad cutter bullets. 
There was a through and through bullet wound in the head, and there was also a bullet that was recovered from his chest cavity. So who was the man found in the suitcases? It was a mystery that unnerved the residents in the area, including Susan and John Rice, and they had reason to worry. Their longtime friend, Bill McGuire, had been out of touch for more than two weeks. It's so out of the ordinary for Bill. Th that's just not his personality. And John and Susan would know. They'd been friends with Bill for years. John and Bill met in the Navy and had been best friends ever since. When Susan started dating John, Bill was part of the package. Bill had a great sense of humor, very intuitive, smart guy. You know, he was just fun to be around. And he was even more fun when he met Melanie Slate. They were both working their way through school, and they quickly fell in love. What made Bill and Mel a great couple was that intellectually, I think they were on the same level, the same sense of humor. I, I couldn't picture a better match for Bill than Melanie. In 1999, Bill and Melanie were married. Within three years, they had two sons. The young family lived in Woodbridge, New Jersey. Bill was a computer analyst, and Melanie was a nurse at a fertility clinic. They seemed to be your average happy couple, the only thing out of the ordinary was Bill's hobby. He liked to gamble big time. Bill did very well in Atlantic City. He was a proven winner. It just seemed like anything that he touched, he would win. Bill's goal was to win enough to buy a nice house for Melanie and his sons. On April 28, 2004, he fulfilled that dream. He signed the papers on a half million dollar home. The day he bought the house, he called me up and he's very excited and he said, John, I, I've closed on the house. When are y'all gonna come up to help me move? But John never heard another word from Bill. A few days later, John got a call from Bill's sister. Hello? Bill was missing and she was afraid something had happened to him. John immediately called Melanie. She told me that they had gotten an argument. He went in and packed his suitcases, walked out the door and said, you'll never see me and the boys will never have a father because of you. We couldn't believe that Bill would just up and leave. Up and leave Melanie and up and leave the boys. My reaction was to call Bill. Just couldn't get a hold of him. Was looking everywhere. So when suitcases suddenly started appearing with body parts inside, Susan couldn't help but think the unthinkable. I remember saying to John, honey, wouldn't that be piteous if that were Bill? And John said, honey, don't, please don't talk like that. Then on May 21st, 2004, Susan happened to catch another story on TV about the mysterious suitcase John, man. Look. The newscast said they had a sketch that they were gonna put out there to see if anyone knew who this person was. And immediately, my stomach just dropped. The police sketch, looking back at her, was unfortunately a face she knew all too well. In June of 2004, Bill McGuire of Woodbridge, New Jersey was missing. His wife, Melanie, said he walked out on her and their two children. But Bill's friends in Virginia Beach, John and Susan Rice, didn't believe Bill would ever do that. In the meantime, the body parts of a man had been discovered floating in the Chesapeake Bay. Then authorities released a forensic sketch of the man's face to the media. It was the face of their missing friend, Bill McGuire. John and Susan contacted police. A fingerprint comparison confirmed it was, in fact, Bill. Now that the police knew who the man in the suitcases was, they needed to find out how he got there. So they reached out to Bill's wife, Melanie. She told them she hadn't seen her husband in three weeks, not since they closed on their new house. And that night, 
wasn't a good one. They had gone to bed, woke up around 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, and immediately they start arguing. This argument, according to Melanie, uh, became physical, where William allegedly slapped her in the face, and then he stuffed a dryer sheet in her mouth. Melanie said she ran to the bathroom and locked herself in. She could hear William rummaging through drawers as if he was packing some stuff. And he leaves the residence saying that you'll never see me again and drives away. But now Bill was dead. And Melanie told police she wanted to do whatever she could to help. She asked us if we had located her husband's vehicle. She said that you would probably find it in Atlantic City. Melanie was so helpful, she even tried to help police come up with the reason why someone may have wanted to kill her husband. She suggested it might have been something to do with the mob. You know, maybe he owed money and ended up swimming with the fishes. After all, Bill was a gambler. But since the mob isn't known for neatly packing bodies in suitcases when they dump them, detectives ruled it out. They moved on to the murder weapon, a 38 revolver. Melanie said they didn't own any guns. Police were getting nowhere, so they asked if they could take a look at the McGuire's apartment. But to their surprise, just three weeks after her husband disappeared, Melanie had moved on with her life, literally. She packed up the place she and Bill had shared and rented a new apartment. We asked her, where's Bill's clothing? Where's his personal effects? Well, she had given all that property away to people that helped her move out of her apartment. Kind of odd, you know, just because your husband is allegedly left doesn't mean he's not coming back and may want to claim his personal effects. Let's just say detectives were suspicious. So after the interview, first stop, the apartment Melanie and Bill had lived in. It turned out Melanie was every landlord's dream tenant. The floors were glowing and shiny. The walls appeared to be freshly painted. So it looked like someone had paid an awful lot of attention to that apartment. But the apartment was a dead end. There was not a hair, not a skin fiber, not a partial fingerprint anywhere. It was as if no one had ever been inside. So if Bill had been murdered there, there was no way to know. Looking for anything to help solve the mystery, police tracked down Bill's belongings to the man Melanie gave them to. This guy said, yeah, I helped uh, Melanie McGuire move. I never met her before. She was a friend of a friend. And in return, she gave me all of her husband's clothing. And he still had the clothes in the same large black plastic trash bags that Melanie had packed them in. You had three suitcases wash up with garbage bags. Now, garbage bags are created by machines. There has to be tool marks. There has to be a way of identifying. So if we assign detectives simply to research the manufacture of garbage bags. In the meantime, police turned their attention to locating Bill McGuire's car. They put out an all-points bulletin. And wouldn't you know it? The vehicle turned up precisely where Melanie McGuire had told police they might find it, Atlantic City. A search of the vehicle revealed Bill's briefcase and laptop, and something else. Microscopic bits of flesh. These are tiny, tiny pieces, not something that may even be evident with the naked eye. But one of those pieces, by way of example, contained an entire hair follicle. DNA tests revealed that the hair follicle and bits of flesh once belonged to Bill McGuire. So it looked like whoever took Bill apart was most likely the person who tracked pieces of him into his car before dumping the suitcases into the Chesapeake Bay and Bill's car in Atlantic City. But who would want to kill Bill McGuire? Police couldn't even ask Melanie anymore because her attorney informed them she had nothing left to say. But that wasn't true. Ah, thank goodness for wiretaps. Is there anything else you're not telling me? Like what? Like I killed my husband? 
In May 2004, the body of Bill McGuire was discovered in three separate suitcases floating in the Chesapeake Bay. His car was found in Atlantic City with tiny bits of his flesh ground into the carpet. His wife, Melanie, had decided she was no longer willing to assist detectives in the investigation. Police were on their own. Looking for hard evidence, they intensified their search for the murder weapon. William was killed with a 38 caliber gun. So, of course, we were going to look to see who had a gun that was close to William. Police checked gun registries and gun shops all over the Northeast. And two weeks later, they found what they were looking for. We learned that Melanie had purchased a 38 caliber gun and another item for $9.95 at a gun shop in Pennsylvania. And that gun shop only sells two items for $9.95. Both of them are bullets. The exact type used to kill Bill McGuire. And there was something else. Melanie bought the gun just two days before her husband disappeared. So Melanie had lied about having a gun, and police wanted to know what else she might have lied about. That's when they checked her emails. They discovered Melanie had been chatting online about lots of interesting things, like how she wasn't getting along with her husband. And judging by the number of emails, there was one confidant Melanie really seemed to lean on, Paul Smith. Investigators soon learned that Melanie and Paul used to work together. And now, years later, Melanie had reconnected with Paul and made him her go-to guy on everything from relationships to firearms. She turned to him because she knew he adored her, and he was a, a gun buff, and started telling him that she wants to purchase a, a gun because William is acting strangely, and she's scared. And from the look of the emails, Paul appeared to be buying Melanie's story. Police brought Paul in. He defended poor, innocent Melanie. That is, until police told him about Melanie's new handgun. Yes, he'd talked to her about firearms, but he had no idea she actually made a purchase. Now even Paul was suspicious, and he agreed to help police by taking part in a recorded call. Wasn't Melanie thoughtful? Here she had told police that Bill had stuffed a dryer sheet in her mouth. And now she admitted she had bought him a firearm. And where was that gun? What about the gun? What about the gun? I don't have it. Well, who does? I don't know. Clearly, the gun conversation was not a favorite. But it's not to say Melanie couldn't find humor in the dark situation. That Melanie, always so quick with the witty comeback. If she only knew that just after she was burning up the phone lines with dead husband humor, police were looking at comparison reports from the forensic analysis on the black trash bags. She might not have been so glib. The forensic scientist was able to determine that the bags that contained the body parts and the bags that Mrs. McGuire used to give away his possessions. They were manufactured at the same time, basically on the same machine, in almost sequential order. I think it was within 20 bags of each other. That's right. The bags were from the same exact batch. That meant they had come out of the same box. So whoever packed Bill's possessions had also packed Bill. Oh, Melanie was in big trouble. After piecing together all the evidence, 
the bags, the gun purchase, the car's location, the DNA on the floor mats, and the clean apartment, the police could finally explain what happened. On April 28, 2004, Bill came home after closing on the family's dream home. Elated, he called his best friend John to share the news. But police now knew not everyone at the McGuire's was happy. You see, no one, not even Bill, was aware that after five years, Melanie was extremely dissatisfied with the marriage. So when Bill was making plans for their future, Melanie was making plans of her own that didn't include Bill. The murder began with a celebratory drink. Forensic tests from Bill's autopsy later revealed that it had been laced with something to knock Bill and his enthusiasm out. But Melanie wasn't done. If she got rid of her husband, she could keep the kids, live where she wanted, and do what she pleased. Yes, Melanie was ready to move on. So she dragged Bill into the bathroom, and she grabbed her new 38 and shot him twice. One of the bullets that was recovered was covered in fibers, similar to what would be inside a pillow. So it's very possible that there were efforts made to muffle the sound of the gun. To make it easier to get rid of the body, Melanie cut it into sections. Police believe she probably used a saw and a knife. She kept the water running to keep the mess to a minimum. We don't believe that it would have looked like a horror movie, because if someone is controlling a situation, just like when a medical examiner does an autopsy, you're able to clean up and be careful. Then she packed the three parts into trash bags and put them in the family's luggage. Melanie then took the three bags, filled with Bill, and drove south to Virginia. She dumped the suitcases into the water off the Chesapeake Bay Bridge and tunnel. Thinking the ocean would hide her secret forever. Her final stop? Atlantic City to get rid of Bill's car. On March 5, 2007, Melanie went on trial. After just a little more than a month, she was convicted of first-degree murder. How do you find us with the count of the indictment charging Melanie McGuire with the murder of William McGuire? Guilty. The way that I envision Melanie now is she's got evil going through her veins. I see Satan in her eyes. I just, she's not human. <laughs> 